10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Hello everyone, hope you're okay. We're just having a quick flying visit. Because he's off walkies in the garden from the assistant, Fluffy Research Assistant. He's come to say hi. He's been helping me today with gathering together a lot of his, well, um, my dad's, so your granddad's, I suppose, your granddad's um, books. Lots of various institutional naval architect books coming up today. And this one has been helping put them together. So, hello, everyone. I hope you can see him. Let me just check. Yes, it is going out. So, hello, everyone. We hope you're well. We hope you all had a lovely Christmas. And thank you as ever. Hello, Rick. Hello, Rick. Hello. Currently, he's watching the person who's about to take her for a walk. So, you know, take her. <sighs> hello, everyone. Let's see. Hello, Don Shay. Yes, hello, trainee apprentice, fluffy research assistant. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. He's off for his wander now. And you'll notice something. There is an addition. As well as a bottle, I have a can here. This is courtesy of my lovely, lovely girlfriend. And there is a reason I have a can here. There is a reason also I need a screwdriver to get this life up. The can I have here is because with the can and me only filling this moderately, then this will fill up with the can four times. So there'll actually be four glasses to drink through. Because this one, if I do it fully, can drain the bottle in two and a half glasses. All right. Hello, John Shea. Hello, Peter Dawson. Hello, Albert Zasky. Hello, Rick Vasa. Hello, Alex Miller. Hello to Virginia and British Columbia. Hello, Derp Squad. <laughs> Hello, Yickers. Hello, Michael Rose, Juno 101. And hey, I managed to get earlier than 1806. You know, I, I, I've been having conversations with XSplit and Ian and I have reached an understanding, which is basically in the new year when paychecks and everything are regular and hopefully organized and everything's now not being so mucked about by COVID. Um, I will be upgrading to the professional X split for the cost of whatever a week, a month, so that it works. And I stop having these problems. Also, I've kind of changed the set. I, I, I've gone into the BIOS and changed some of the settings of my laptop to uh, make it more YouTube happy. <laughs> uh, hello, call uh, Juno uh, one one. Hello from the laundry mat. Um, <laughs> our dryer is furbard, so hello. Well, good luck with that. Hello, Carl Gasberg. Hello, Dan Freeman. And Greg Sutowski. Hello. Hello, Jeff Vila. Have I missed a good doctor singing? Not yet. We can want me singing, seriously. There would have to be a lot of money involved. I did the Africa thing as a one-time thing for a bit of fun, and it's it's haunting me. Puppy is currently rebelling, if you can hear from out there. He's, he's found something far more fun than going to the loo, which is chasing my sister's toes. This is why when I put him out, I wear shoes. Right then. How did I kind of hammer? We'll be back later. Just finished. I eagerly await the sing song. 
No big deal, but it's Vasava. Vasava. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Come on. You did. Uh, you 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 did reach an understanding and have a plan. <laughs> Good evening, Shane. Hello, Sam Thompson. Um. Mm hmm. Right then. So I had. While I was getting all this stuff together, and before I get into the book view part, I had a little discussion myself. And it was kind of sorted out by this appearing. Now, this appearing is something my dad wrote a few years ago. And I'd spent a lot of time going through my dad's notes because they're pretty interesting on naval architecture. And they sometimes lead me astray with certain engine designs. And they sometimes provide me with some pretty useful insight. So. Now, I'm not going to go into this in full detail because it is literally four pages long of writing and I will be reading it all out. But this was basically my dad writing in 2009. He liked to write these sort of articles and it's one of the reasons which inspired, talking about this was one of the ideas which inspired Bill Trumps to do the competition we're currently running, of which... The competition email address is in the description of this video. I'll put it right in this. Yes, that is the right one. Anyway, so this was how my dad started off. Apart from the ICBM threat that the RN nuclear submarines contain and offer a counter to, there is a change in the role of military forces from national defense into an international global peacekeeping role, often in remote places where the ability to operate in narrow spa uh, spatial confines without infringing the sovereignty rights, uh, sovereignty rights and the rights of neighbouring countries can sometimes be a crucial factor in the ability to be adjacent to the bushfire zone. The challenges for the proper fulfilment of this change requires an assessment of what equipment and weaponry is actually needed now and will be in future by our forces. He's writing this in 2009. The concept of this future, and indeed it is actually an immediate enforced change, gives rise to the question of, do we really need standalone aircraft carriers? The craft, as at present contemplated, will be built to conventional standards and ideas for involvement in what type of conflict? They will not last for the 30 odd years or so that the vessels are usually built to serve, as they will have no strategic role to play, refits are expensive and the vessels are therefore at present times a waste of vital financial resources just to boost someone's ego and probably an attempt by the MMD and others to maintain its vast size by keeping a service arm alive, which no longer has a valid raison d'etre. Further, what is needed for squadrons of expensive fast toys? Slimming all the MMD down is a future, not only political debate, but a necessity on the grounds of proverbial number of staff required to fix the light bulb syndrome. It might even be time to move to combining all services in one organisation. Are there not pressing and big financial incentive savings to just do this? Now, the thing about my dad, and what you realize when he writes his articles, is he often starts off with all the ideas which are coming out in terms of the ideas being expressed, and then he starts knocking them down where they're good and where they're bad and talks them through. He goes through this whole thing, as I said, in four pages, and ends with... basically designing an LHD. The whole docking space has to be provided with heavy lift. It's no good having all this equipment at your disposal if you cannot retain the initiative because the gear you need is not quickly accessible. Time is often the essence. In this sort of operational situation, and not being able to get a helicopter on deck, running and away within minutes loses valuable time and everything else as well. But then again, what would a pen pusher know about such a situation? The hull docking space has to be provided with heavy lifting and loading equipment to load the landing craft housed. Hull routes for bringing equipment from its storage to the docking space have to be adequate and easy to use to facilitate a speedy embarkation if required. 
Landing craft for troops and equipment available within the docking space will have to be fast, capable, and efficient at their tasks. Perhaps a version of the wave-piercing catamarans that form the basis of a lot of fast waterborne transport craft these days. Currently, most navies are currently looking at us. Anyone think this paper got read? Uh, this may be a better option than the rather slow box-shaped craft that are used at the moment. It goes without saying that the aircraft and all equipment, machinery and tools must be modernized versions for operation in a salt-laden environment and be suitably safeguarded. This vessel must carry the necessary number of tanks, armored vehicles, land rovers, guns, power plants, all designed for the purpose and all operation capable of doing the job with adequate spares and repair facilities for them on board. In this respect, a clear, concise design requirement should be issued to, by a slimmed-down, non-interfering MOD for the government who may buy it if it works and does the job, but otherwise the expense of development is on the provider. It would lead to a quicker, more efficient supply of what is essentially needed. A bit radical, but long overdue. It would be big, but oh so useful. And he even put forward possible names. HMS Windsor Castle, Edinburgh Castle, and Carnarvon Castle. Naming vessels after rulers has never really been our style. Now, my dad used to write these papers all the time. Some of them got a lot of places, and some of them didn't. But it was the standard idea that when you were a naval architect in his period, you would put forward a concept paper. You would put forward an idea. It might be on many things. And it would be, it's how he adapted and he proposed projects. And it was looking through these concept, uh, these concept papers that came up with the idea of bilge pumps, of the competition we're running, uh, sort of, of the email we have going like, if you want to go see it, want to hear about the, uh, the competition, episode 29 has all the details. And basically, we're asking for you to send us a PDF with your ideas for an episode, your concepts, and we'll, ha and we'll have you on to talk about it. You'll have to, to an extent, defend it to us. Although, considering, let, let's put it this way, if I put this one in front of Drac, he would be going, Ah! My super battle cruiser! In five minutes. So, I hope you all had a very good Christmas, and I hope you're liking the idea of the competition. Thank you, Juno One, I'm pre or pre ordering the book. Hello, Aviator Enterprise. Hello, Nautical Wolf. Hello, Crowbird79. I don't think I've seen you before. Dev Squad, I hope the glorious Blackburn Blackburn brought you and your family a delightful, generic midwinter, mandatory festivist enjoyment timeframe. It was interesting. Hello, new IKB4472. Do you know what? Can I get this as a PDF, please? Um, unfortunately, his 2009 document I literally just have in paper form, but I might well type it up. I might type it up. <laughs> ah. Ah, Ryan. Yes, going through my dad's stuff is always an interesting end. Uh, end to itself. Did I have turkey or goose, Tian Wang, aka Golden Dragon? Um, we had turkey. I will scan it to VDF at some time. Probably. Probably scan it to PDF. I don't know. I might fix the spelling for him because I realise this is one of the draft documents which survived. He delete his habit was to delete the things, but he saves a lot of the draft paper copies. And usually, what I do is I find them tucked into various versions of this. So, to be fair, I found this in 1928. So that's what happened to him. Uh, did you see an announcement by Drydock Games about Task Force Admiral? No, I haven't. That sounds cool. New World. Hello. Hope you all these have treated you well so far. They have. There have been lots of mince pies and lots of turkey and uh, pigs in blankets. Thank you, Osprey28, for the super chat. <laughs> Afternoon, DM Carpenter. It's 
It's going to sound strange. My family don't actually give me books for Christmas anymore. Um, they've given up trying. I am slightly annoyed in that one of my cables snapped in the storm last night, so I've got some lights about power. But um, I'm fixing that. It's amazing. The new system, lights, it's a cable, snapped. The really thin one. The really thick one, which is about 10 years old. That's fine. So the cable, which is like that, managed to break in the wind. And I know I can see it on the camera doing it. But the cable, which is like that, and chunky as anything, and so isn't designed to be invisible, but is designed to be really good at surviving outside. Fine. I don't know. Now... Before anyone thinks I'm being rude, I am sort of being rude, but that's because I've just been messaged by my girlfriend saying the link I've sent her didn't work. So, um, I like breathing, and I love her dearly, and she did send me the cans of Iron Brew, so I'm making, I'm sending her the link again. Right then. Uh, come on, maybe keep the misspellings as they add to the authenticity. Uh, probably, but there is part of me which feels that as a fellow dyslexic, I should do a bit of proofreading for him. Uh, and my dad was undiagnosed, but I am very, very certain was dyslexic. <laughs> very. Uh, my mum certainly isn't, and it. My dyslexia came from somewhere, as did my sister's dyspraxia. I'm fairly sure both came from him. <laughs> Texting above the desk, please. I was above the desk, it's just not in the line of camera. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Right, so New books I do have some new books And they're quite cool ones And these were sent to me to review So, first off we have this little book. World Naval Review 2021, edited by Conrad Waters. And it's lovely. Got a whole special section about how the Type 23 frigates are evolving. And it shows their history. It even mentions how they got rebuilt at one point, or redesigned at one point. It managed to skip over, it just mentions it was done at Yarrow's. It skips over the fact that the chief designer who did it was my dad. But it does have Montrose in it, which was the first one to receive the modifications. She's always looked so pretty. It has David Hobbs looking at World Naval Aviation. Very nice. And it has some stuff about amphibious warfare in, of course. It's just, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous book. It really is. Again, there is a link down below, which should take you to it, um, if you're British or European. Um, the American link, I'm still having conversations with Amazon over. They've only just realized that YouTube goes worldwide. So, here is what I always love about these books. 
they have sections on different navies. And this one has a section on the Royal Swedish Navy, which is done by Dieter Stockfish. And it's quite an interesting read. And I want to read out a specific section to you. Responsibilities and mission. The ability to maintain a credible military defense is a prerequisite of Sweden's total security policy. In turn, this requires the Swedish armed forces to be sufficiently available and prepared in peace so as to be rapidly available to able to assume a higher degree of readiness if situation so demands. The overall mission to secure Sweden and country's freedom by protecting Sweden's sovereignty and national interests both inside and beyond Swedish territory, preventing and managing conflicts and war, protecting Sweden's freedom of action when faced with political and military pressure, assisting the civil authorities as necessary. The SM's, or Swedish military's, responsibilities are subordinate to these overall aims and are effectively focused on ensuring some of Sweden's territorial waters and coastline remain under Swedish control. A range of surface, underwater and amphibious forces are able to perform these tasks described more fully below. Goes through the organisational structure, the amphibious regiment, the submarine flotilla, the naval warfare flotillas and their roles, the third and fourth naval warfare flotilla particularly. It has the strength of the fleet, it has their details, and it just... It is a really, really cool book and really interesting. If you want a baseline idea of what navies have been up to and are up to at the moment. And then in significant ships, we have America class. Yes, the America class are here. And I find it kind of interesting that they word it America class opportunities and challenges. Which is quite true, but it depends on what you want your ships to do, what's going to be an opportunity versus what's going to be a challenge. With American 16-inch 16, uh, 16 Mark 6s. If I would have put them quickly in service, they wouldn't have gone with American 16-inch. The Americans had enough trouble supplying the 16-inches to them. The British could have built more 15-inch quite easily. We still had a production line, and we still had spare barrels. So, honestly, if they'd wanted them quickly, if they'd been that desperate for the Lion class, they would probably end up going 15-inch with the British 15-inch. That's my theory, anyway. Um, I wonder where the Kuznetsov is being uh, uh, refitted now. Oof. Wherever it is, I hope that it's a secure, safe facility which cannot sink. Hello, Ruin Cash. And froze. Next split froze for a second. Had circle there for a minute there. Um, okay. I have no idea why XSplit sometimes that plays up. I'm not sure what you missed. I hope it wasn't anything too much. Sure, Mac. I wonder why the Russians are even bo oh, bothering this because that's of. Um, how do I put this politely? Because they haven't got any other option and they want to maintain their status. Kuznetsov is all about status. Kuznetsov is all as, uh, just about status. Similar reason for why she wouldn't be sent to Darlan to be refitted. Because uh, that would kind of admit that they couldn't main and they couldn't do it themselves. 
Right. Um. Next book. Now, this is particularly cool. And I did use this to talk about this the uh, earlier today to talk about this upcoming brew ship, this brew ships. And there's a reason I used it for that, because it's very, very, very cool. Now, Taranto by David Hobbs and Naval Air Warfare in the Mediterranean, 1940 to 1945. And it got me thinking. It got me thinking a lot. But let's start by reading out this section. Formidable search aircraft had better fortune, and at 0720 on the 28th of March, 5B, the most northerly Abacor, located and reported four enemy cruisers and four destroyers. And at 0739, such a search Albacore Air 5F made an initial report of four cruisers. 5F's report was 15 nautical miles in error, and Valve thought uh, Vice Admiral Valve thought that one of the groups reported might even be his own force. That's the Vice Admiral Light Forces. 5B's report was three, Zara, was three Zara and two Abzuri class cruisers, and 5F's three Trieste class cruisers. Doubts were dismissed at 0745, however, when smoke was seen to the north of Val's flagship Orion, and minutes later enemy cruisers were identified. At 0812, the Italian cruisers opened fire. Surface visibility on the 28th of March was good, but from the air it was as patch it was patchy and never more than about 10 nautical miles. Winds were variable, but sometimes strong enough to affect accurate air navigation and introduce inaccuracies in both sides reporting. As the first Italian salvos fell short, 5F reported three battleships, but no verification followed, as the Junkers JU-88 chose that moment to attack and the Abacor was forced to take evasive action. Brindam Whipple discounted this report, knowing that the Garibaldi-class cruisers had similar silhouettes to the Cavour-class battleships. He was closing Cunningham's force, but the enemy ships were faster than his and drawing nearer. He did not yet know that an enemy battleship was only 16 nautical miles away on his port quarter. Cunningham was receiving conflicting reports from both naval and RAF aircraft, and as a precaution, he ordered formidable to range a striking force armed with torpedoes at 0833 hours. Fifteen minutes later, he instructed Malem to launch 815 Naval Air Squadron to attack the enemy cruisers, but his signal did not reach Commander Beale until 10.05. Signals for Malem had to be passed through the cruiser York in Suda Bay, but she had been be beached after being damaged by ten explosive motorboats. Alternative signal routing caused delays. At 0830 hours, Gloucester catapulted her walrus to spot her gunfire as opposing cruiser groups exchanged long-range fire. And as her salvos found the range, the enemy turned away and at 0855 firing ceased. The walrus remained airborne and transmitted enemy reports, but did so on the spotting wavelength. And none of them got any further than the ship's gun direction teams, who failed to pass them to command. This was particularly unfortunate because they included the first sighting of the third cruiser group. North of the group which had just ceased fire. Had Valfour Cunning received them, they would have helped clarify an otherwise obscure picture, uh, although the proximity of the enemy battleship would still have been unknown to them. At 0900 hours, Admiral Chario ordered his cruisers to withdraw because of the danger from attacks by carrier aircraft. As they turned away, Val followed and maintained contact, heading northwest at 28 knots. At 0922, Cunning decided to delay Four Minerals Strike Force until the situation was clarified and requested 201 Group RAS to send flying boats to locate and shadow the enemy fleet. Reading through the action reports many years later, it was not clear how he thought 201 Group could provide any assistance in the short term, but doubt about the possible presence of enemy battleships was probably utmost in his mind. Worryingly, Four Minerals observers were omitting their duty letters and even their own positions from sun shadowing reports, and this added to the confusion in the flagship. 
The CNC staff was never made aware of the patchy visibility from the air. Now, there are some Hobbes books which are less good than others, but he, kind of like Friedman, never really does a bad book. This is Hobbes at his best. This is Hobbes providing the history, the ideas, the events, the context, the details. Now, why did this book make me think? And why have I sort of rushed it in, in that normally I do a separate new books, and today I'm doing combined new books and transactions with architecture. Well, this book especially, reading through it all, not just talking about in individual operations, but talking about the whole naval air war, started me thinking something. Started me thinking that when we focus on World War II, when we talk about the carrier lessons of World War II, most of the lessons drawn from World War II seem to be heavily drawn on the American experience in the Pacific. The battles of Midway, of Coral Sea, of all the different operations which end up, getting, which end up taking place in, in that particular part of the world. And... I am more and more thinking that the lessons from the Pacific are less applicable in many ways than the lessons from the Mediterranean. Now, let me explain why. The Pacific, naval carrier aviation was able to take part in a battle where mostly it was carrier aviation versus carrier aviation or carrier aviation versus land aviation. Rarely was there carrier and land aviation versus land aviation, and could have been potentially, if any of the other sides had had their own carriers, carrier, carrier, land, and land all versus each other. The fact is that didn't happen. There are some instances where it comes close in the Pacific, but never actually quite happens. So Mediterranean is the closest scenario we have to that, especially with the island campaigns and the island bases of the Axis forces. And you start to think about future warfare. Well, there has been an explosion in both the availability of anti-ship missiles, the availability of drones, and the availability of manned aircraft, of crewed aircraft, around the world. If you're talking about a peer-on-peer -peer conflict, you ergo are almost by default nowadays heading more likely towards a scenario on the part of the Mediterranean than on the part of the Pacific because of the relative capabilities you're going to be dealing with. That's something we have to start thinking about. And this book is a great place to start. It's no fuss, no muss, it's just history. And that's good. That's worth it. Mm-hmm. Uh, where is the fluffy research is the big one he hasn't come for a visit yet I will send a message and see if he wants to come for a visit but if he does the trouble is the bed's kind of taken up with books at the moment so he wouldn't have much space he does usually like to spread himself out on the, uh, the bed at the moment the books the bed's covered in nine of these so you know <laughs>
Yeah. Because Netsov is an interesting discussion point. It is really an interesting discussion point. This is the last one of the three. Helping stop Hitler's Luftwaffe. Uh, the memoirs of a pilot involved in development of radar interception vital in the Battle of Britain. I'm not sure if Trent is watching tonight, but Trent usually likes radar stuff. And when I saw this, I thought, oh, I've got to get it to have a look at it for Trent. And it has a very interesting section. Chapter 8. 23 Squadron, Henlow, Night Exercises, 1925. After leaving Sealand, I was uh, Sealand, I was posted, as already stated, to Number 41 Squadron at Norfolk. I very soon got the sack from there for incompetence and found myself posted to a new squadron being reformed at Henlow, Number 23 Squadron. On formation, 23 Squadron was equipped with the Sopwith Snipe, the last of the three Sopwith biplanes which were produced in the latter stages of the First World War. In chronicle order, order, these were the pup, the camel, and the snipe. The pup and camel were certainly used in combat to a considerable extent, and the fighters of the First World War were in many cases flying them when they achieved various victories. Whether the snipe was produced in time to be used in the First World War, I am not quite sure. It was the last of the Sopwith biplanes, and the largest uh, with the most powerful engine. The engine was known as a BR-2, Bentley Rotary 2. A rotary engine like the others, but bigger and heavier. It was also the last of the aircraft engines produced by the Bentley Company, afterwards well known as the producers of the famous motor car, the Bentley, which was in production for many years and eventually merged with the Rolls Royce. Even up to present day, I think there are models of the Bentley. The Bentley B2R engine in the Snipe had an, or or had an orthodox operating cycle. It was not a single valve like the Mono Super in the Avro 504K. The result was that the handling of the engine, from the point of view of the controlling the power by throttle var variation, was more or less orthodox. But the combination of a very large heavy rotating mass attached to what was a very really a very small, light aircraft producing marked, uh, produced marked gyroscopic effects on the handling of the whole airplane. Now, the S, yes, this is a gentleman who ends up as Air Marshal Sir Arthur MacDonald. And, yes, he did say he got sacked from a squadron for incompetence. And, yes, that is literally how he, the entire book is. So, I would say not the best writing in the world. But... There are very few accounts, personal accounts, of the development of radar. There are even fewer accounts of the aviators involved in development of radar, and I can think of no account which is quite so as encompassing and as full as this. So if you're interested in the development of radar, and you don't mind reading a book which is a little bit rhetorical, and at points seems to be, well, as you just heard, he, the aircraft, did, he isn't sure if the aircraft he was flying had entered in World War One or not. There's a footnote, it had. Um, it, 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 there's all sorts of things for it, hesitant for it. It's still worth reading. So... I, it, it's not an easy enough read that I would say unreservedly 10 stars, 10 go and get it. Everyone should read it. But I would say if you're interested in enough topic that you're not going to be worried about that, this is worth getting. It's a good book. And certainly worth it.
Jovila, naval air warfare and Mediterranean lady is not well covered at all. Um, well, this is why this is good, because it does do 1940 to 1945, so it's fairly decent in that one. New IKB 4472, the bed might be covered by books, but your lap is free. Yes, but then I won't have any control over the computer at all with him in my lap. That's eight, that's Now, next we're getting on to the transactions, and that's, I know, what everyone's been looking forward to, brew ships this evening, and it is the transactions. But I did want to sort of go through these new books first, because they are some gorgeous books, and two I have no reservations at all, definitely get. One, as said, if you're interested in the topic, definitely go for it. If you're just buying it for a read. These are better. This is if you're interested. If you want current navies, you want this one. If you want naval history, you want this one. If you want to think about the future naval air warfare, you want this one as well. Mm -hmm. Right, let's just catch up with the chat. Uh, let's see. Oh, we've got a lot of discussions going back and forth about Kuznetsov. Uh, lots of conversations going back and forth about Kuznetsov. Um, because Netsov will only be on beyond repair when Russia wishes it to be on repair. That basically comes down to Putin. Also, the Russian economy is something which has been talked about falling over a lot of times over history. So far, it hasn't fallen over. It looks weak, and I have to admit it is structurally quite weak, but it tends to manage to get through thanks to Mother Russia's Saving grace, natural resources. Now, at the moment, with the global slump in oil prices, this might be a long way coming. But there are other things which Russia has which they might be able to get through. Gas, oil are not the only resources they can resort to. And... Sure, Mac, they have talked about ordering thousands of T-14s. So far, they have provided... They have built 14. I think T-14s, literally. That's why I saw the other day, and it just stuck in my brain. Right on. So, before you get into the transaction, they've locked X. Tends to help have one of these. This is 
an index book. That's true. These books are so massive and so big, there is actually a separate book as index to them. Hello, Carl Harmon. And this has lists of papers. And it does all the ones from, well, this is covers. This is in, in, in volumes. Well, how do I put this? Volumes 47 XL VII to 80. 1905 to 1938. And it's only when you start reading this, you start going, oh, wow, that's got that volume in, and I have to go that. And there are things like the New Scouts. I wonder what New Scouts are by Admiral C.C. Fitzgerald. Oh, cruisers. That's from 1906. And Gas Engines for Ship Propulsion by J.E. Thornycroft. That's also from 1906. Types of warships submitted in recent programs of naval construction. Standardization, a report on the work done by Engineering Standards Committee. on uh, no, uh, That's by Lord Brassey in 1909. The Battleship of the Future by Rear Admiral RHS Bacon in 1910. A report on the progress of the natural experimental tank. Lots of very interesting things. Some military principles which bear on warship designs. March 1912, Volume 54 by Admiral Sir Reginald Eustace. Custis. But today we are starting off with 1919, which means. starting off in this area. Ships of the British Navy on August the 4th, 1914, and some matters of interest in connection with their production by Sir Philip Watts. Naval construction during the war by Sir Eustace T. Dennicott. Naval Construction Corps of the United States Navy by S.V. Goodall. Yes, that's Stanley Goodall. Some recent developments towards the simplification of merchant ship construction by Sir Eustace T. Denicourt and T. Graham. Some experiences with the electric welding of warships by W. H. Guard. The tonnage of modern steamships, A. T. Wall. And volume March 1920. I think I left the 1920 book downstairs. That's annoying. Because HMS Hood is in 1920. And I don't think I have that for today. If I remember correctly, I have 1919. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Nope. No Hood. Hood will be next time because there are like 90 of these books to go through, so there will be another time. Uh, do you know what? Not? Please just say, do say more. Do I need a book, a bookshelf? Well, there are like, as I said, about 90 of these volumes. My dad had a complete, has a complete set, which I've inherited, I think, all of. I think I've got them all. I'm not sure. There's quite a lot of them. And, um, Hood's in 1920, but we're starting off with 1919. 
And the reason we're starting off with 1919 is because I thought World War One would be quite a fun place to start. Now, the thing about these books is you realize very quickly they are naval architects' books. And as such, they like their drawings. They really do like their drawings. So, I'm going to hold this up. But I'm having to be very careful because it's very, very old paper. And my plan... When I've got my office set up, um, oh, that's just helpful, isn't it? Thank you, Argencourt. You're covering up Canada. That's really kind of you, Argencourt. Oh, I positioned the camera wrong for this one. <sighs> You have Canada. I am sorry if I can't do it better than that, but because I find if I put it straight on, it doesn't always work that well with the cameras. And there you go. And there are, in this version, this one alone, there are something in the region of three dozen plans some for things like flotilla leaders or destroyers HMS Royal Sovereign HMS Erin. Which is a good example of... Can I add another gun there? I always think of HMS Erin. Courageous and Glorious are both here. Ooh. They do look good. They do look good. And I will not try and say what the prices of these ships are, of these books are online. I have done some looking around, and honestly, they can vary quite heavily. But these are complete plans they have on them. They are an excellent resource for anyone. And if you're like me and you do this as a profession... They are pretty much an essential thing to have. Oh, that's cute. That is cute. Sorry. Um, a pea boat, Admiralty design as modified during World War One. Rather cute design. I'm not sure how well you can see it. But, yeah. This is a lovely book. Now. <laughs> there everyone. It looks like you need a friend nearby <laughs> who's going to have more free time and has an amazing quality scanner. Uh, yes, me and Drac could well be working on his book shortly. Uh, DM Carla, do you have these de-acidified? 
do you keep these out of signing paper? And I keep them in special boxes at the moment, but my plan is to eventually have them stored in my office. And this is one of the reasons why I'm, bu I'm building very proper shelves and they're going to be well looked after in those shelves. And they're going to have, um, they are going to be in the only shelves which actually have covers. Now, got the regulations and the reports. And then page one. Now, I could read for you the report. And that would be fun. Um, but, and y you have seen nothing till you've seen all these tables and everything about the warships they built and what they were doing and Australian warships, Canadian warships, the lots are covered in here. Everyone in the Commonwealth is mentioned in this discussion. And all the various battleships get a mention. Goodness me, this is a long report. Every time I get in here, I remember how long it is. But. The thing I like to read, it's not the actual report, although I do tend to read that. Uh, Carmen, do you have all the Damien Lewis books? I have a fair number of them. I'm not sure if I have all of them. Um, the drawings are magnificent, and my plan, as I said before, is once I've got my laptop, I've got my PC set up and everything, and I can do these, pro these lives, I have got what I use for work somewhere around me he says, somewhere around him uh, a microscope camera which I can put up over the book and I'll be able to show the book to you in another screen so it'll be sort of like a screen focused on me and a screen focused on the book um, Do you know one of them? They cost an arm and leg. Let's put it this way, that way. Yeah, they do. Oh, I am sure they do. My dad spent a lifetime building up his collection. <laughs> These books must make a fine. Do you know one? Amazon link, please. Uh, I, I, I couldn't. I could find some on Amazon, but they were all very, very expensive. So I kind of went the route of I won't be that cruel to anyone, and I'll let you go see if you can hunt one out of your own exp uh, uh, your own. Thing. Stay. So, you fall down, you and me are going to have words. Admiral Sir Reginald Custance, CGCB, KCMG, CBO, DCL, Associate Member of the Council. Lord Bristol and gentlemen, you will no doubt agree with me that these two papers are most useful contributions to the proceedings of the institution. But, if I may suggest it, they might be made more useful to be consider. To outsiders like myself and to laymen, if Sir Eustace the Court would add in his tables the percentages of displacement that have been allotted to the whole armament armor speed of the capital ships. This information was added to the tables. This will enable us to follow the law or the principle that has guided these changes. What strikes me especially is that Sir Eustace the Court and the Corps of Naval Constructions have had a blank check on the Exchequer of the Great Britain in the matter of building. That has helped them enormously. You are in a position to say whether they have made good use of that opportunity, but it seems to me that although no doubt mistakes have been made, they have made very good use of their opportunities, and the result have been seen in the Grand Fleet. The innumerable desi new designs which they have had to deal with have apparently all met with success, and the results are to be seen in the strength of the fleet in all classes of ships. I would specifically draw, especially draw, your attention to the table Sir Eustace Dinner Court referred to, in which he compared the tonnage and the number of heavy guns in the British and German navies at the beginning and at the end of the war. 
you'll see from the table that we had a great superiority to start with and a still greater superiority at the end. No doubt there was in the beginning some deficiency in the smaller type of craft, but that has always been the case in every war. And in this case, deficiency was made up during the course of the war. It is an interesting point that about six months before the war, there was a professional discussion in which it was pointed out that Germans would use their submarines to sink our merchant ships. The reply that was then made was that America would so strongly object that Germany would never do it. I mention this incidentally as an interesting forecast of the war. Moreover, six weeks before the war started, I read a paper at the War College at Portsmouth in which, after examining the history of the past, I foretold that uh, I foretold that in the next war the, str the struggle would be between a torpedo armed submarine and a gun armed small surface craft, and further, that it would not be necessary for the main fleet to keep the sea. That forecast has been completely borne out. I mention this because it shows the advantage of studying the past, deriving lessons from it. And this should encourage us to draw lessons from the present war. One of the most difficult things is to draw a true lesson from what is going on under one's eyes. To do so requires a very wide knowledge, a very exceptional man, and a most careful sifting of the facts. As a rule, after every war, wrong inferences have been drawn. If I'm not detaining you too long, I would go a little further into the question of the principle underlying the armoured cruiser. The Battle of the Falklands has been referred to. I am not at all sure that a whole the facts are before you. The armoured cruiser was originally intended to deal with trade routes and protection, well, protect merchant ships. It was pointed out at the time that they would fail in doing that because it would be necessary to concentrate them, and you will note that von Spey, having, ar having armoured cruisers, proceeded to do so. It was easier to deal with him when he was concentrated. To deal with a dozen MDMs adrift on the ocean would have been much more difficult. In order to stop trade, a concentration of effort is required, not a concentration of forces. So that from the German point of view, the armoured cruiser was not altogether a success against our trade. There are many sides to these questions. Take the case of the cruiser in the North Sea. The German high seas fleet was composed of capital ships and of battle cruisers. The battle cruisers were fast. The Germans were tempted, having those fast battle cruisers, to raid across the North Sea and bombard Lowestoft and Scarborough. That was perfectly useless and had no effect on the war at all, apart from the people living in Lowestoft and Scarborough. They risk part of their high seas fleet without adequate cause. They weaken that fleet when the control North Sea depend on them keeping it strong and using it as a whole. These battle cruisers were really a disadvantage to Germany in that they encouraged her to misuse and mistrust her fleet. Again, consider the convoy system. What is the philosophy of the convoy system? The object in war is to destroy the armed force of the enemy. The object of the German submarines when they went out was to sink our merchant ships. The German submarines wanted to invade our armed ships. The only way to get an enemy who wishes to evade you is to get him between him and his destination. His destination was our merchant ships, and therefore we placed our armed ships alongside our merchant ships so that, they were, that we were ready to destroy the German submarine when it appeared. That means, of course, that ultimately the Germans would have had to concentrate a larger force to attack the convoy in order to overcome our escort. We, in turn, would have had to increase our escort, and so on. Out of the convoy system ultimately comes the concentration of the fleets. These remarks have been thrown out to show you how complicated the whole question is and how necessary it is for to be very cautious before coming to opinions on very particular class or any particular class of ship. You will readily understand that the, these complex matters cannot be adequately discussed in a short speech. But I must not detain you longer. Wow, a speaker who self uh, short uh, self centers his time is just it's just amazing. Uh, speaking as an academic, I never hear that. It's terrible. Sir John Bills, LRDS, DS, Honorable Vice President, my Lord General, these two papers summarize the naval construction work of the lifetime of I think the oldest living naval architect, certainly in this institution. They reveal all that has been done, and it has been reviewed after what we have all looked forward to as a solution of some of our great problems, namely a great naval war. Whatever we shall have another great naval, whenever we shall have another great naval war, preceded for so long a period by a study of naval architecture, warship naval architecture particularly, time alone will show. Those who have worked at these uh, designs, though, all the preceding years have got the results before them, and perhaps the more interesting at the present moment is the paper by Sir Eustace Denacourt, in which he summarises the work of naval construction during the war. The Royal Corps of Naval Construction has assisted very ably in carrying this work through. Anyone who has seen them at work, or who has been working with them, knows how hard the work has been.
it's really quite interesting reading through this and the works of people involved. It's just, it is an amazing text to get into. It is very, very rich in content, and it is very, very interesting in terms of its stylings. So I highly recommend these books, but they are expensive. They are really, really expensive. Um, it is, I think it's about 80 books in the full series and John Shea, it's fairly rare to find a, a full, a, a full set. It is fairly rare to find a full set. My dad's full set was quite rare. And I think I've kept it all together. I'm not sure. There are some being stored in different places and some of my aunt and uncles and some are here. So I'm hoping no one's, you know, done anything wrong with them. <laughs> Do you know what I'm on my one? Right, who wants to buy a kidney, arm, and a liver? Because those books are, um, yeah. Hmm. <laughs> I will find it before I die. Yeah. They're good books to have. They really are. They are, are really lovely books. Right, and if I remember correctly, 1925 is my next book. Let me just check. Yeah. 39, 34, 30. 1925. So it's 45 minutes. So I'm at 42 onto that timing. Forty two onto twenty seven equals O one O nine. Um, Jeremy, are transactions used to source naval history publications as they should have been? Uh, not as often as they should be. And one of the interesting things I find when I'm reading books is I look through them and go, and you haven't referred to the transactions papers because of this. You haven't looked at it. Uh, what are transactions? There is an interesting debate going on in the chat about Aragon and Turkey. And I would be say be very careful before making any foreign announcements on Turkey. They have enough internal issues going through them that often, rather like when a while back I was talking about the Cold War and there was the whole mm, pan-Arab conflict, let alone the Arab-Israeli conflict going on, and how the Arabs didn't understand, the Americans couldn't understand why the that uh, the Arab nations weren't more interested in the Cold War and were more worried about that. 
Turkey is a classic example. Of this. There is far more internal issues going on in Turkey that are far more important to them, and they are far more concerned with their potential conflicts with Greece than they are with Russia or China or anywhere else. It's one of the... Just because those these things matter to us on a foreign policy scale, do not presume they matter to other people. And do not presume that because those are the big factors that might affect our own internal politics because of the foreign policy, those are the things which affect them. Sometimes we look at it and go, oh, that shows that they have that power, or there's a phone call from Russia, or this, that, it. Mm. That lovely coincides, but it might not have any real factor. Chris Southgate. Hello, Chris. Our transactions are, are currently continuing series. Yes, they are. I would say the discussions about Turkey while I'm doing the transactions are kind of fun to watch because I keep getting distracted going, oh, I want to get involved that, and then going, hang on, I'm talking to the transactions. Anyway. 1925. And so. 1925. What is in 1925 that's so interesting that I picked it up? Well, believe it or not, it's not relative commercial efficiency of internal combustion of steam engines for high-speed Panasonic vessels by Sir John Phillips, or Japan's contribution to naval architecture by Professor P. F. P. Purvis, although that is a very interesting chap very interesting paper. Analysis of Sir John H. Barr's experiments on HMS Wolf in the light of uh, Sveitska's theory by G. H. Hoffman is interesting, but and here is what I'm talking about because this is one of the interesting things about these books. There is an Admiral D. W. Taylor, U.S. Navy. Talking about wake propeller coefficients. Page 66. It's where it begins. But why is wake propeller coefficients so important? Why is it important enough that I put it above all the others to talk about? Well... For that, we have to go to discussions. Mr. Stanley V. Goodall, in, and this is being said in 1925. Stanley M. V. Goodall, uh, Royal Corps of Naval Constructors, MBE. Mr. Luke asked Admiral Taylor to lead the, uh, lead the amateur a little more gently from step to step as the arrangements are developed. I should like to emphasize that by asking Amber Taylor if he would make the first paragraph on page 67 and table Y on page 68 a little more clear, as I had some difficulty in following this table from the explanation given in that particular paragraph. I understand the top line of the table gives the variation of pitch ratio between the limits, say 0.6 and 0.7 and so on. When I had the honor of serving under Admiral Taylor, I took the opportunity of comparing American and British propellers and forms of vessel as well as American and British methods in carrying out tank model experiments. I found little difference between the two, if former, in spite of the fact that in regard to propeller experiments, the methods at Washington differ somewhat from those developed at Haslar. I think I'm accurate in saying, Admiral Taylor, correct me if I'm wrong, that at Washington, wake and thrust deduction values are deduced from experiments with the appendages fixed on the model. Whereas at Hadler, Hasler, these experiments are carried out on the model without appendages. Mr. Payne pointed out that at the Admiralty, it is the practice to apply the tank data suitably modified according to the results of ship trials. He referred in, tank, he referred in particular to the correction placed on pitch values. So it comes to this. That Admiralty practice is based on trial results backed up by model experiments. That, too, was American practice, but Admiral Taylor's paper indicates how it is possible to design a very good propeller entirely from trial results. When I was in the United States... I was particularly impressed with the care taken in carrying out ship trials, the variations in number of trials made, and the great mass of data collected. 
I'm quite sure that the conclusions reached by Admiral Taylor are fortified in his mind, at any rate, by even more trial results that he has been good enough to quote in this paper. This emphasizes the value of remarks made by the First Lord of the Admiralty last night in regard to research work. With the time uh, Admiral Taylor now has, he is able to devote his great powers to research work as such as this, which results beneficial to his service and now made available to us. Unfortunately, as the British Admiralty owing to economic reasons, research work cannot receive such attention just now, but I trust that events will, will not prove this to be a penny-wise and pound-foolish policy. Now, I am often asked the question, Who is the equivalent officer to Henderson in the US Navy in terms of his effect? And well, I would argue that Rear Admiral. D.W. Taylor. Hello. Hopefully this is back. Ah, it's been weird. Now. Admiral David Taylor, and I have worked out what one of the problems is. For some reason, the hardwire connection appears to not be working at the moment. I do not know why. Um, me and it are going to be having fun shortly. Add that to another thing I need to buy, another cable I need to buy. Um... Right then. Don Ragama, having got Dr. Clark talk at the one and a half time speed was an interesting experience. Yes, well, currently talking about David Taylor. Now, I would say if, and the, there is a small problem with my putting forward this idea, because of course he dies in 1940. And he does actually retire from the US Navy a lot earlier than that. He, you know, retires from the US Navy in the sort of the, uh, uh, um, it, well, until 19, in 1922, theoretically. However, Ta David Watson Taylor is one of those officers who might have retired from the US Navy in 1922, but it still has a massive impact on the US Navy till my, uh, up in that, that period. In fact, I would argue he never stops having an impact. Mostly because... He has built up a legacy of naval forces. He has built up a legacy of naval design, which structures through the US Navy as they prepare for World War II. So Taylor is really, in many ways, the father of naval architecture and father of development as far as the US Navy goes. So the US Navy, as it is that serves in World War II, is a product of him. And it might affect... The fact is, his paper is all focused on how to achieve as much refinement as you can with testing. 
It's not your cabin internet, it's my cabin internet, apparently. I'm not sure why, but for some reason, the internet cable, after working fine all day, has suddenly decided that, no, I'm not going to be an identified internet cable. I'm not going to connect to the internet. I'm going to be annoying. I have no idea why. It's just decided it. Ten squad, Dup, I don't care what the CC did in World War Two. They found the nation a certain way and then transformed it into eh. spectacular. Mm -hmm. uh, Dup squad, did you forget to sacrifice the required number of calls on uh, the altar of the Dark Going Background? Maybe. And that if the required number is any, I didn't sacrifice a single one. Are uh, all of Drax rodents accounted for? That might explain some of the cables. No, I'm, I'm sure that wouldn't be the case. Judging mine and Drax's similar tendencies towards pyromania, it would be interesting. Um, is Alex Miller, is Admiral T Taylor, David Taylor, the namesake of the US test basin outside, the, uh, outside DC? Yes. <laughs> because he built it. And then they renamed it after him. After he died. Oh. Right. Yeah. How is the office going? The office will be built soon. Can't come soon enough. PC, space to move around, new bookshelves. It's going to be my whole January building it. <laughs> I will go for it. Even if I am having... The thing was, I set this all up and it was all working fine. Using... Ah, well, it's now dropped it down in terms of scaling to support the one supported by Wi-Fi. That's the thing. If it's doing Wi-Fi, it insists on doing it as 480. If it's doing on the hardwire... Eee, by gum. I'll have a chat with that. So... Now, next book is 1926, and why did I get 1926 out? Well, because it has in it a very interesting topic. Let's see. Now, That is the March one, yes. There is the present outlook for British shipping by ACF Henderson, but there is also the launching arrangements of HMSS Nelson and Rodney, all interesting topics, and some recent modifications to water tube boilers of the free drum type fitted in Her Majesty's Navy by engineering Captain L.M. Hobbs. All fun stuff. But. There is something slightly more interesting in there. Now. One eighty three. One of the things you realize about these books is literally they never know when not to put in a massive table. There is no comma, there is no thing, as a, there is no uh, soul analysis which goes, this could do with a massive table. Ah, but we don't have space. Yes, let's add in a big page. Just 
it's just wonderful. It is wonderful to read through. Now, I will explain what this paper is about, but I want you to guess, see if you can guess right, from the comment, the, the articles I'm just about to read out from the discussion. Mr. W. H. Hamilton, uh, w. Hamilton Martin, associate member. In a foreign shipyard where I received part of my training, the manager decided, after carefully considering many different types of lifting gear, to install stationary hammerhead tower cranes between two 550-foot berths, which had little space separating them. This happened, I might mention, about 20 years ago. First, cost was a question of importance, but at the same time, a high mechanical efficiency was aimed at. The free cranes were erected, which at 90 foot radius lifted three tons. These cranes could reach over the vessels and lift loads from the rails alongside the berths. They overlapped each other by about 15 feet to facilitate passing loads over to one another. A fourth and heavier crane was subsequently added at the lower end of the berths to lift heavier loads occurring there and to lift from barges in the water at the end of the berths. Remember rightly, this was a seven-ton type. As the plated shed was parallel to the berths and about 70 foot away, a travelling crane of 15 tons was also installed, which ran with its front leg on the rail of the retaining wall of the berth and had its after end on a rail fitted about 20 feet high alongside the shed wall. Over the front leg and end, this girder type of crane carried a tower type revolving crane, which could therefore cover all the area between the berth and the shed and swing over the berth to supply material to the fixed cranes and put on board the heavier items, such as winches, loading mar and mast, deck house deck. This type of crane's equipment fully proved the correctness of the choice which had made at the time, leading to a very substantial saving in building time and labour. As to the question of cost, it might be interesting to mention that these fixed tower cranes at the time only cost £2,000 each, including foundations, or less than half what would have been paid to the, for them today. No doubt a great advantage was the fact that in this instance, all the materials could be bought alongside and not only at the head of the berths or between them. The crane equipment question was very largely, de very largely depends on the situation of the berths in relation to the point of supply of the materials from the plating sheds which varies greatly for every particular yard and makes generalizing particularly practically impossible. Professor C.M. Carter Hmm. Professor C.M. Carter, I think this paper shows the, uh, the great value of the work that our institution does. Quite apart from producing its annual volume of transactions, Mr. Smith was awarded an INA scholarship some years ago. And more recently, this research scholarship. I think this paper is one to be studied at leisure and to have for permanent reference. It provides the great value for work which can be done by the holders of these research scholarships and the benefit they can confer on the profession at large. The paper strikes a note which is very much to the fore of these days, namely economy. It's rather striking that the papers read at this, uh, this meeting on the instrument should, to a certain extent, start on a note of economy. Mr. Henderson's paper on the outlook for the British shipbuilding brings in economic questions. Then we had Mr. Lovett's paper, and we finish up with a paper which is great bearing on the economical building of ships. Lieutenant Colonel C. Tennyson. Remember, although short, this paper includes a lot of useful material. Some of the members, however, may conclude from this paper that a fair comparison of all existing systems of shipbuilding cranes can be made in a general, uniform way simply from the point of view of mechanical efficiency. I think that very often there are other considerations which appear more important than mechanical efficiency and which influence the shipbuilder in selecting one system or another. I would like just to point out a few such considerations. In the first place, with regard to quantity of work, which you usually have in hand. If you can be assured of having your berth always full, more or less, then of course you will prefer an arrangement of cranes which gives you greater economy and speed for work. 
and you do not mind so much the prime cost of the installations. If, on the other hand, as very often happens, you do not expect to be normally busy on every berth, or if you have only periods of busy work, as happens in some countries, that, of course, may lead you to adopt another system. Another consideration should be quality of work. For instance, the quality may be more or less uniform, or maybe more different kinds of, mostly different kinds of work with different methods. I suppose every shield builder will easily understand what I mean. Again, if ships have to be built very quickly, whatever reasons may be, the arrangements to be made would not be the same as if they were time for building the ship. Now, another consideration may be the method adopted for building ships, which varies according to country or shipyard. For instance, in German yards, you see more of what I call a standardization than you would see in this country. The Germans are very keen to diminish the number of profiles, patterns, models act they use, and this, of course, makes a difference in the layout of cranes. Then again, in some yards, a great deal of work is done outside the berth, such as assembling, riveting act. Whole bulkheads, for instance, are, as pointed out by Mr. Smith, are assembled and lifted in position. Furthermore, there is also the question of climate. Climatic conditions may induce you to prefer one system over another. Thus, covered in berths might be very useful in cold countries such as Russia. Russians used to go so far as to actually build brick buildings over their berths with walls and a roof like a workshop, which involved having special types of cranes inside them. Let's see, did anyone guess cranes? Hello, Elder, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, have you missed the Holy Blackburn Blackburn? There has been lots of mentions of the Holy Blackburn Blackburn. Uh. Uh. Let's see. Vision. Miss Tito, a historian and writer, has a great YouTube channel called Vintage Face. You, sir, are following in the path towards success by being turned up by non-fiction academic writers. Uh, I would say I'm more following Drac, but, you know, in terms of I was doing a, lot, a fair number of things, but after a while, I sort of, when I started doing it regularly, Drac's the one I went to. But I'll go have a look at Miss Tito's one. Vintage Face could be cool. I could uh, get some good ideas from there. I never mind where I borrow ideas from in academia. You give reference, but you're allowed to borrow. Mm. Uh, Sean Mack and Dan Freeman are sorting out the China Turkey discussion going on. Thank you, gentlemen, for being very good chat monitors and admin people. <laughs> oh. These books are very, very cool, and you don't, it, it's going to sound strange, but. The most expensive books in the range, the most difficult to find, are these index books. My dad has a whole set of all three, which is very, very useful. I do intend them all to be up in a nice bookshelf in my office, so I can just grab them when I want them. At the moment, they are stored in a special place, which keeps them okay, but in, bo in boxes. Now, I have, because it's managed to reset itself three times, I cannot update the times we go now, so I'll have to do that later. So I do apologize if anyone's re watching this video before I've updated the times and said when I'm starting new, uh, new books, because sometimes when it does the resetting thing, I have to literally start, uh, start it and just watch it through and go, well, oh, now I'm saying this. 1926. 1928. Now, why did I pick 1928? Well, it literally is for actually the first paper. The present position of the question of fuel for ships by Sir John H. Biles.
Have I paused again? Uh, the auto stream is current bitrate is lower than the recommended bitrate. We recommend that you use an auto stream of 128 kps. Uh, oh, well, I'm going to have to have a conversation with the audio stream at some point, aren't I? Okay, hopefully that continues to work quite happily. Who knows? You never know. All right. They're actually published by the Institution of Naval Architects, so they're under their car their car they're under their um their copyright. Hello, Yogi Khan and John Shea. And Chris Hathaway. Oh, good, it's working. Your dulcet tones are unaffected at the moment. That's nice, Juicy Zijun. That's very kind of you. Right, let's get rid of the widget. <laughs> now, let's open this up. This one has a lovely picture, 1928, of Sir John Fornicroft in it. Now, I remember when I was talking about him in 1905, he was presenting a paper about gas turbines for ships. And by the way, his paper, the, the rules he established in his paper still do cover how we fit gas turbines into ships. And the only problems have been when people have tried to break those rules. President at this uh, particular meeting is the Admiral of the Fleet, the Right Honourable Lord Wester Weymouth. And the, as I said, the present position of the question of fuel for ships this is the paper we're looking at. And of course, as always, I'm not going through the paper because I think you should be able to look up the paper yourselves. I think you can look it up online, hopefully. If you can't, I will try and find a way of getting a copy out there, because it's a very interesting idea. But, it's the discussions I go to, because the discussions are where you learn quite so much. And here is Engineer Captain J.C. Brand, Royal Australian Navy. On page three, the author asks, can any means be adopted to make coal so liquid? Yes, if powdered fuel be pulverized fine enough and separated so that one cubic feet occupies 64 cubic feet instead of 48 to 50 cubic feet, it becomes a liquid and will flow and can be pumped or siphoned. It can be forced through pipes by means of a cooler Kenyan pump or ejected by pressure. Powdered fuel, properly treated, can be stored for an indefinite period in any quantity or of any depth, and can subsequently be removed from storage by mechanical appliances, thus fulfilling the desideratra uh, laid down by the lecturer. Powdered fuel, like oil fuel, can be loaded into a vessel through hoses, and 10 tons per minute can be loaded through one 6-inch hose. Though, as the flow is intermittent, 300 tonnes per hour represents the net input from one hose. As regards air heating, referred to on page 4, in a very recent test on a marine boiler, 
fitted with a brand burner, the secondary and primary air were heated to 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Combustion was completed, uh, complete 18 inches from the burner mouth. The percentage of uh, carbon dioxide in the combustion chamber varied from 16.5 to 17.2 with 1% of free oxygen and no carbon monoxide. The temperature of the gases after passing the air heater was 430 degrees Fahrenheit, and 90% of the ash was recovered. These were preliminary trials, and it will be interesting to see what the efficiency is when proper measuring apparatus has been installed. Small coal, such as slack, can be passed on board through hoses pneumatically although approximately two pounds of air per pound of coal has to be vented from the bunkers. In like manner, slack coal can be extracted pneumatically from the bunkers. The installation on the Mercer and her voyages are a credit to those concerned, and if she has not been as successful as might have been desired, this can be attributed to the system and partial failure to recognize the peculiarities of marine boiler work, such as a. Each furnace and combustion chamber is separate and must be fed separately, and in such a manner that the percentage of fines and superfines in the dust are intimately mixed and supplied in the same proportion to each burner. Supplies of coal and air must be capable of variation in the degree of 10 to 100% to meet the various exigencies, such as winches in harbour, lighting up, warming up turbines, slow stop and full speed. C. Unless a rate of only about 80 pounds per hour is fed to the furnace whilst lighting up, the tubes and surfaces become foul before the actual work of the boiler commences. D. All joints to the pulverizer must be flanged, and no dust should be present either in the pulverizer room or boiler room. E. Dust should not be blown up uh, the funnel by soot blowers to pollute the decks, but reclined as of yore from the furnace. I am in hearty agreement with the author when he states that the Admiralty or the government should demonstrate what is possible with pulverized fuel. Whilst I agree that the fuel research department might assist, I contend that the naval architecture and marine engineer, with his intimate knowledge of problems to be solved, is the correct person to set necessary considerations of the superintendent design and erection. The brand burner was the first turbulent rotary flame burner to be used on a marine boiler in any country. It is of British origin and today produces perfect combustion in a shorter distance than any other burner. While powdered fuel loaded and carried on board can be more than compete with the oil engine, fuel ground on board is not quite so effective economically. Finally, let me emphasize that there is not the slightest danger in carrying fuel on board if the bunkers are sealed and inert funnel gas is used to exclude air from these compartments. Dr. Bauer, there can be no doubt that Sir John Biles' paper will arouse the keenest interest of all ship owners and shipbuilders, as it concerns one of the most important questions with the shipbuilding the world today has to deal with. Being responsible for a good deal of marine engineering work in my own country, I often have the opportunity to study the comparative economic values of steam and diesel plants of various design, and I do not hesitate to say that on the whole, the data given by Sir John Biles in his table, I agree with the results of my own investigations. I should like to complete. Sir John Ball's table I by adding a few data regarding piston engines with exhaust turbines designed according to the system developed by Dr. Wack and myself. I have chosen as example ordinary triple expansion engines working with saturated steam of 390 degrees Fahrenheit and alternatively with superheated steam of 590 degrees Fahrenheit, the exhaust of which is utilized and an exhaust turbine and have been based my calculations on exactly the same principles as those chosen by Sir John. The results are given in the Annex Supplement to Table 1. These results can, of course, be still further improved by using mechanical stokers. The tables are actually in here. And guess where Dr. Bauer comes from? These results can, of course, be still further improved by using mechanical stokers, higher steam pressure, and fast-running piston engines, or cold firing. But I have thought it better to restrict myself to ordinary marine steam plants, whose reliability have been proved in actual service. <laughs> Mr. James Caldworth, MSC, Associate Member. It appears to me that Sir John Barnes's paper demonstrates very effectively the truth of the statement that one can prove anything by figures if the initial assumptions are incorrect or incomplete, completely defined. 
There may be some routes on which coal costs 20 shillings per ton and oil 80 shillings, but the author can hardly ask us to believe that this represents a fair average of the bunkering prices throughout the world. Yet these are the figures on which Table 2 is based. The author himself speaks of £22 per BHP as a fair average figure for the cost of diesel machinery. Yet he uses £24 per BHP on compiling Table 2. Even £22 BHP is high for installation of the size quoted. The time at sea, 200 days, given in Table 2, is much too low. Surely 240 or 250 days per, all, um, per annum is, average, is near an average figure. The longer period would show the oil engine in a more favourable light. A final comment on Table 2. It appears that the author has quite forgotten that fuel is used in port. The oil engine car general cargo ships with electric auxiliaries and diesel generators would use about 36 tonnes a year for this purpose, as against 400 to 500 tonnes a year in a steamer. Throughout the paper, there is the tacit assumption that the oil engine ship will run at the same speed as the steamer. But one of the greatest advantages of diesel engines is that it can be run economically at a higher speed than can be possibly be adopted for a steamer on the same route. As a result of this, the diesel engine ship gets a preference with shippers, and it's more likely to carry a full cargo than its slower steamer on the same route. The true indication of the relative merits of different types of engines is given by the building programs of those owners who have tried the steam reciprocating engine, the turbine, and the oil engine. Such owners are now, in almost every case, having diesel engine ships built to the complete exclusion of the other types. The table on the first page of the paper is misleading because it is taken over so short a period. Curves show the showing the tonnage of different types under construction since 1920 give a much truer comparison of their relative popularity. Such curves show a steady decline in reciprocating engine vessels. There is a rapid decline in turbine engine vessels until 1925, with slight improvements since that date. On the other hand, the oil engine ships show a steady, ra steady rapid increase with one very slight setback about the end of 1926, which has been more than made up since then. There was a time, some nine or ten years ago, when over-enthusiastic supporters of the oil engine put forward misleading running cost comparisons to bolster up their case. The oil engine at the time was much more expensive than it is today. Such comparisons did the oil engine a great deal of harm in the eyes of the majority of the marine engineers. The position appears now to be reversed, and the present paper is intended as a bolster for the rapidly declining marine steam engine. 1928. It's getting down. No, it's called Are the Books Still on the Copyright? Um, potentially some of them are. Vision, you look sad, just thoughtful? Um, just thoughtful. Sacrifice as many ceasefires as necessary. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, Jermak, air coal powder mixture pumped into ship boilers. This sounds like something from German World War II napkin Ah, uh, it's fun times. Fisherman, railroads investigate pulverized coals for steam turbines locomotives. Ah, uh, that was fun. Uh, Jesus, fair enough. I like to see testing done from a safe distance first. We all would. <laughs> ah. Oh, yes, the trains versus ships discussions. Let's see, 1929. Well, I could give you the Sea Trials of Italian Destroyers by Lieutenant Colonel F. Bodana. I could give you the turbine installation on the booth liner Boniface. I could give you Atlantic Liners by General E. De Vito. But honestly, for 1929, there is only one paper any of you will actually want me to read. 
There is only one. Um, just checking. Well, they haven't tucked it in, in anywhere else. Sometimes at this point. Yeah, there it is. At a certain point of in the 1920s, they decide they are going to do this. They're going to stick the pictures in the back. You all want paper one. Nelson and Rodney. And I'll be very nice to you now. I'm going to upload a picture straight away to YouTube, to the community. of this plan. Because I know it's what you all want. You can pretend you want the Atlantic liners, but we all know it's Nelson and Rodney. All the Italian destroyers. And this is the first time and only time I'm probably going to read... Actually, I'm just going to read. I'm just going to reorientate the picture a bit because it's decided to put it upside down. And that will be live on YouTube now. So, the terms of the Washington Treaty permitted this country to proceed at once after its ratification with the building of two capital ships. And this exception, all capital ship construction of the power powers signatory to the treaty was suspended until 1931. It is therefore hoped that an account of these vessels will be interest to the institution and provide a fitting sequel to the papers read in 1919 and 1920 by former directors of naval construction v. Ships of the British Navy on August 4, 1914 by the late Sir Philip Watts and naval construction during the war in HMS Hood, both by Sir Eustace Tennyson Danicott. Dirt Squad, how detailed is this plan? Can I take them to the local shipyard and start laying the keel? Uh, give it a go. Before proceeding with Nelson Design, it may be of interest on place to place on record a short summary of the history of capital ship design and construction for the British Navy between time building HMS Hood and laying down of HMS Nelson and Rodney. During this period, a large number of designs were proposed for consideration of the Board of Admiralty, embodying, embodying the lessons of war experience and recommendations of the Post-War Questions Committee, as a result of which orders were placed by the Board in October 1921 for four battle cruisers. The shipbuilding firm selected being Messrs. John Brown of Kyblenk, Mrs. Fairfield of Govan, 
Messrs. Swan Hunter of Wall's End, and Messrs. Beardmore of Dalmore. These ships had an armament of nine 16 inch gun guns in three triple turrets and 16 6 inch guns in eight twin turrets, and a speed of 32 knots, requiring a shaft horsepower of 160,000. The legend displacement on the basis then in use was 48,000 tons. The corresponding standard displacement as defined by the Washington Treaty being 47,540 tons. Their size was limited by the dimensions permitted passage through the Panama and Suez canals and by the docking facilities at Recife and Portsmouth dockyards. In succession to these battlecruisers, there was under consideration a battleship design with a displacement about 500 tons greater carrying nine 18-inch guns, 16 6-inch guns, and a speed of 23 and a half knots. Shortly, however, after the orders for these four battlecruisers have been placed, and whilst the designs of the more powerful vessel referred to above were still under consideration, the negotiations which culminated in the signing of the Washington Treaty took place. The construction of the battlecruisers was suspended in November 1921, before any work had actually begun, and the building contracts were definitely cancelled in February 1922. As affecting capital ships, the relevant conditions imposed in the treaty are all the joint treaty definitions. It goes through it, and this is a beautiful paper. But the great thing is, as the paper began at the beginning, this paper is presented by Sir William Berry, Vice President at the time of the Institute of Naval Architects. The first person to start talking in the discussion is Sir Eustace Denicott. I would like to congratulate Sir William Berry on his paper about these two very important ships. I and that uh, think that it is very satisfactory that he has been able to publish particulars of these vessels and that the paper should be read before this institution, thus forming a complete and continuous record in the transactions of the institution of the first line of the Royal Navy over a period of some 50 years. With regard to the inception of the design of Nelson and Romney, Sir William refers in the early part of his paper to the scrapping of the designs and cancelling of orders for four 48,000 ton battle cruisers, which orders had originally been placed in 1921. As he mentions HMS Hood in this connection, I think it will not be amiss to remind this meeting that four vessels of the Hood type were originally building, and a great deal of work had been carried out on them when it was decided to scrap three which were already in frame. This was only a part, though an important part, of the very large tonnage of war vessels scrapped at that time before the Washington Conference had been suggested. I think people do not realise what an immense amount of tonnage was scrapped on that occasion. Speaking of myself, if you will allow me to do so for a moment, I may say that I am placed in a rather peculiar position regarding the design and construction of these vessels. As Sir William Very points out, the design was got out whilst I was Director of Naval Construction at the Admiralty, and therefore, I was entirely responsible for it. Under the great instructions of the Board of Admiralty, I am actually therefore not in a position to severely criticise my own work. In the case of Nelson, I was pleased and placed in a curious position, because on behalf of the Admiralty, I signed the building drawings, which were issued to the constructors, and a little later, when I had left the Admiralty, I signed them on behalf of Messrs. Armstrong Whitf Whitworth Company, who were the contractors for the Nelson, and I was therefore able to superintend not only design from the first, but also the actual construction ship, detailed plans of which were developed in conjunction with other contractors, Messrs. Camel Laird and Co., under the supervision and with the approval of the Admiralty, and throughout the building, received every possible assistance from St. William Barry and the officers of the Royal Naval Courts of Naval Construction. The design of the Nelson is unique in more respects than one. To begin with, as the author has pointed out, it had to conform with the, to the conditions and limitations laid down in the Washington Conference. I do not think any designs going out of the got out of the Admiralty have ever had to comply with such limitations. These conditions set a definite maximum displacement which had on no account to be exceeded. And they decided upon the maximum calibre of the main armament, so that the best possible design had to be got out under those very severe restrictions. On the other hand, Board Admiralty demanded a ship embodying all that the war experience showed to be necessary, and they asked for a vessel of good speed combined with economy of fuel and large radius of action, the most powerful armament and also with the protection as complete as it was possible to make it, in order to defend the ship from attacks by bombs from the air, plunging shells of the maximum calibre, namely 16 inch, and underwater attack from the most powerful mines or torpedoes. This is cool.
it is a good book. And these are... <sighs> Let's put it this way. Uh, I, I, I think Drac is hoping very soon for me to have my garden office built because, you know, I, I, I think he's planning on at some point without, of course, coming near my mom's sister and with, of course, government COVID rules allowing to um, basically come and have a fun fruities. That was 1929. Dan Freeman, a telephone rings. Hello, is that Kevin and Mersey? Yes, I'd like to place an order for a custom ship build. Okay. <laughs> uh, so carbon is roughly twice as dense than oil. But on kilogram of higher grade coal contains nine kilowatt hours oil a bit overloaded. So is a tie depending on shape uh, ship size, maybe? Potentially. John uh, Greg Salsi. Clarkson got his PBR, so how hard can it be? John Shea, saw Nelson Ronnie plans, my brain and heart started singing out <laughs> the boat just drinking gorgeous. <laughs> Uh, the bows are the bows are uh, bows are disposable. Uh, yeah, for that's for the tribals. <sighs> Costrans, <laughs> does anyone have much of a primary source archive or naval documents? Um. If we're talking about the UK, there's the Admiralty documents stored in the National Archives, ADM files. But then there is also the Churchill College Archive. There is... <sighs> um, a whole archive in King's College London, the... Um... <sighs> I've forgotten... Uh, there is an archive there. There's the Wirral Archive Centre, which is all camel heads archives in. There is the Tyne and Weir Archives, which has most of Armstrong Whitworth's archives from anyone from Newcastle. And there is Govan Archives, which is up in Glasgow, which has a whole load of stuff in them as well. And basically, you're talking to someone who spends his entire life going around taking pictures. So I have... About five of these various sizes. This one is one of the new ones and is um, four terabytes, I think. Uh, hard drives full of pictures. Which occasionally causes fun because sometimes I because each one has an index file and I maintain the index files on my computer. And you know, it's fun to try and track them all down. I'm in tier four in COVID wise. No, I'm not insane. Yes, I do have spare seven million. Juicy Susan, if you do, good for you. And this is where King started hating water-based armor. Uh, armor. Yes, um, Nelson and Rodney, water-based armor. King's little heart archives. Yes, it's his little heart ones. Right then. Hmm. That's quite a cool paper. Right, then, nineteen thirty it is. 
and we're going to page 197. Chris Southgate, hard drives can fail. Have you backed up your ba uh, backups? Dirt Squad, tier four. This is definitely not a local, uh, local, local lockdown, honestly. Tier restrictions. Yeah. But you see, I... Uh, this is where I can get into trouble because um, I have anecdotally I see a lot of people mm, being very flexible and adaptable to the rules and to their following them and there is half of me sometimes sitting here going are we really sure this is following the rules, watching the people? Because I live with two shielded people, as I said before, so I follow the rules incredibly strictly. Because I have to. And I have to admit, even I, probably at times, make judgment calls, which others might disagree with. But I'm usually trying to do things like deal with dogs going to vets and those sort of things. I was... On Christmas Day, there was one house I walk past regularly. And when I say walk past regularly, I mean every single day they're on my dog route because they're not that far from my home. They normally don't have a single car parked on the drive. There is an older couple which lives in there, I know that much, and they park their cars, both of them, in their garage. There were four cars parked on the drive and four cars parked on the road next to it. That doesn't seem quite... Right, and we are we're in tier four before the uh, lockdown. Now, I've gone for the sea trials of Italian flotilla leaders in 1930, and there is a reason for this because the Italian flotilla leaders cause all sorts of discussions. And when I say all sorts of discussions, what I mean is the paper is actually shorter than the discussions are. Paper is this, the discussions, make it to this, a lot longer. So why are the discussions quite so massive? Mr. J. Hamilton, OBM, it would appear add to interest and value of this paper if the author could give us some information as to the kind of apparatus used for taking the talk and frost readings. Okay, why are they talking about talk and frost readings? Why are they interested in this? Well, you start going through all the engineering data and the various points, and then you have another point in the come from. And you start to realize 
what they're talking about when you get to there. It is not our custom to make any particular correction for temperature of the water in the reading of the results of of the tank, tank tank tests, but it should be noted that propulsion and towing tests are no longer carried out during the summer months owing to the deformations to which paraffin module, models are subject in hot weather. In the winter months, the temperature of the water in the tank remains always between 12 degrees centigrade and 15 degrees centigrade. The coefficient for calculating screen friction are those adopted by Freud. The diagrams prepared with reference to sea trials have come out. I admit on a very reduced scale in their reproduction, and to meet the request made by Dr. Tefler, I have prepared tables which give the principal figures corresponding to the curves of table I for speeds comprised with regard between 20 and 40 knots. Destroyer speeds. With regard to the interpretation of the phenomenon, I noted the con uh, noted of constant thrust and the higher speed, or at least uh, in the zone of higher speeds in which it is possible to take readings. I stated that the displacement of 1,850 tons, to which were referred all the readings for the various ships, differed but little from that of the trials. There is no difficulty, however, in giving the thrusts which were attained in the same trials. In 1930, the RN is getting very, very interested in the performance par parameters of 1,850 ton ships. A few years later, a certain class enters service, which are 1,850-ton destroyers. Um, Derp Squad, serious question. What are the laws and restrictions in the UK regarding civilian ownership of functioning BL 16-inch Mark I guns, including projectiles and propellant charges? I'm fairly sure the Firearms Act probably has some things which would be applied. I'm not sure if they actually say it correctly. Vision, I got the books Progressive in Navy Blue, 1873 to 1898 by Scott Marnie, and Theodore Oliver Roosevelt's Naval Diplomacy by Henry Hendricks. Thanks, Miss. Cool. Cajun, I work in a supermarket. I'm sure that more than half the people who don't wear masks don't have a relevant medical condition. Mm hmm. Christopher, 16 English isn't that. Only single shot, so shotgun license. <clears throat> Certainly not machine gun. Tempting though. Well, I suppose if you only loaded it with solid shot armor piercing, you could claim it's a 16 inch pellet gun. Nineteen thirty-four. Now, the nineteen thirty-four papers. See what I mean? The index is in a different book. There, there is a whole book in the, a book of index. Well, I could talk about all sorts of different papers I'm going to talk about, but. Um, in 1934, there is one paper, one paper which makes sense above all others, and it's paper number one. And it's a doozy of a paper. Uh, because <sighs> the 
This is how thick it is. It is presented by Sir Arthur W. Johns, then Director of Naval Construction. In 1934 was his last year in post. He would soon be replaced by Stanley Goodall. There's Scott, do you think the police and home office will be more relaxed about it at all, all if I promised to point them at the French occasionally? Probably they wouldn't mind. Dan Freeman, uh, we could... Uh, this is all joking, though. I'm telling this for YouTube authorities. All joking. Hubris. Uh, Dan Freeman, we could hide the gun down at Fort Nelson just outside of Portsmouth among the other ones. No one will ever notice. In 1934, Bijan, a Navy-loving Roosevelt, is president. Yes. And the Royal Navy has a meeting, a discussion presented by the Director of Naval Construction entitled simply two words. Aircraft carriers. The leading navies have adopted the aircraft carrier as a necessary type of warship. And with her older sisters, the capital ship, the cruiser, and the destroyer, the newcomer has been limited by the Washington-London treaties in unit displacement, in total displacement per navy, and in calibre of the main armament. The development of, which is kind of strange phrase to put, but explains because Johns is far more, I would say, of a battleship man, in that his calibre of main armament, the main armament of an aircraft carrier is its aircraft. They haven't been limited. What has been limited in terms of the guns that can be fitted, which I would consider an aircraft carrier, are the secondary armament. But we'll leave that to one side. The London Treaty defines an aircraft carrier as any surface vessel of war, whatever its displacement, designed for the specific and exclusive purpose of carrying aircraft, and so constructed that aircraft can be launched therefrom and landed thereon. By the Washington Treaty, the sand displacement must not exceed 27,000 tons, and the caliber of gun must not exceed 8 inch. By the terms of the same treaty, the British Empire and the United States may each have a tonnage, total tonnage, of carriers of 135,000 tons. Japan, 81,000 tons. France and Italy, 60,000 tons each. What's really strange is Italy goes to held lever to secure this 60,000 tons in 1934, and then they don't use it. They don't get a carrier. By the definition, those vessels which were fitted out during the war and arranged so that aircraft could be flown off but not landed on are now termed seaplane carriers since the aircraft used, uh, used must be of that description. The Albatross of the Royal Australian Navy and the Commandant Teste of the French Navy are the latest, the latest examples of this type. Their tonnage is not included in that, uh, in that allowed by the Washington Treaty. By Article 8, Chapter 1 of the Washington Treaty, all aircraft carrier tonnage in existence or building on November 12, 1921 is considered exper uh, building on November 12, 1921 is considered experimental and can be replaced within the total tonnage without regard to age. The Argus, Hermes, Eagle and Furious of the British Empire, Langley of the USA and Hosho of Japan fall within this category. Woohoo! I keep pointing out this to the world. The, the naval treaties really benefit the Royal Navy. If you think World Wars, uh, uh, well, the wars are going to come in 1940s, the Royal Navy gets to replace Argus, Hermes, Eagle, and Furious without worrying about their ages. Within their tonnage, basically as soon as they want. So that's what Ark Royal, Illustrious, Victorious, Formidable are all being designed and developed for. Carriers, commenced after that date, cannot be replaced until 20 years after their completion. Mm. Now, he helpfully numbers every single one of his paragraphs, and you'll be seeing a lot of this discuss this paper in the in Thursday's live, when I'll be using lots of sections from this paper for my discussion. This one. And another couple of papers.
What's interesting is the discussion then comes on. Again, you've got Eustace and Tenacourt coming in. And there's the Eustace and Tenacourt. Sir Arthur John, uh, Sir, uh, Sir Arthur indicates, the designer and construction, uh, construction of the aircraft carriers has from the start been very much hampered, first by having to adapt old ships originally designed and built for totally different purposes and made to embody in them, as well as possible conditions which were really hardly known at the time were therefore as of an experimental character. Difficulties were further increased by the conditions laid down by... The Washington Treaty and the London Treaty. However, this, uh, in spite of this, I think it will be agreed that considerable success has been attended. The efforts of designers in producing carriers, which, generally speaking, have proved themselves successful. In adapting old ships, many important considerations have to be taken into account. First of all, clear flying decks are essential, and in this connection, air currents must be allowed for, so that there is the lowest or least possible interference with the flight of the aircraft. And... In this category comes the question of hot funnel gases, arising either from a funnel in the middle of the length, length of the ship or carried aft, as in the case of vessels such as Furious. Then the question of stability. Okay, there he's on. How do I put this politely? So Eustace Denacourt's contribution starts, if I point it out this way, the easiest, this way, this position, on this page. Carries on. All the way down. To here. Now, when you realise that the speakers are actually timed in the Institute of Naval Architects, this means the man must have been talking faster than Paris Geller in... I, I, I forget the thing, she was debating Gilmore Girls. I seem to remember an episode of Gilmore Girls where there was this... Paris and a Rory, and they were talking about. I have a lot of cousins. Uh, they were talking about words per minute and the debating. The important thing was words per minute and how fast they were going. Well, he must have been going freaking fast to get to there. In that time, freaking fast. There is, however, not just the wonderful Seuss's Denacourt talking in this paper. There is Captain H.S. Uh, H. Howard of the U.S. Navy. There is Wing Commander T.R. Cave Brown Cave, the guy who did so much testing which actually made naval aviation possible. Then there is Mr. A.J.H. H. Narbeth, who is quite an interesting gentleman, who has one of his comments is, The aircraft carrier appears to be inevitable. It is, however, a very costly and vulnerable affair, and I have no doubt that the man who wants her most, the admiral in command of the squadron, would most probably like to see the type done away with because of the anxieties it brings upon him. The names chosen for the early aircraft carriers are very interesting and, up and opposite. Ark Royal brings to our minds the deep uh, deeds of the daring of the Elizabethan period. Then we have the name of the hero Argus, who was reputed to have had have 100 eyes, of which only two slept at a time. And of Hermes, the hero was diverted to gymnastics and other exercises. Then there is Eagle, the king of birds. Now I think we should be altogether lacking if we did not have to, uh, did not pay, uh, not today, pay a tribute to the flying men who have made such success of these ships. These men who fly off ships and open sea, do their duty, and then come back and all to, uh, and alight again, on a moving ship, deserve our unceasing admiration and gratitude. Not just him, though. Then there is Mr. H. E. Wimpress, Director of Scientific Research of the Air Ministry, offers his points of view.
who is talking about, and this is his idea, aircraft carries average about 19,000 tons displacement. I'm not sure what he's talking about. Um, have a speed of 27 knots, carry 31 airplanes, and cost about 3.3 million. Those 31 airplanes can be carried in six airships, each carrying five, or say seven airships, would be required to carry 35 airplanes. The cost would be 1.4 million. If thus works out, with seaborne aircraft carriers, that every airplane costs 160,000 pounds to carry, while the airborne aircraft carrier is about 40,000 pounds. In a seaborne aircraft carrier, it takes 27 men to look after one airplane, while for airborne one, it would take five men. Difference in maintenance and operation is, of course, tremendously in favour of the airborne craft. Do you really want to do maintenance on an aircraft in an airship? I have no idea, but no. There was a time when airships came under the naval constructor, but they do not so now. By a decision of cabinet, although there seems to be no reason why they should not be in the future, seeing that they are mainly for use to the fleet, uh, mainly of use to the fleet as carriers and as scouts, and so it'd be interesting to hear the director's view as the type of aircraft carrier which would pay us, uh, which it would pay us to put our money into in the future. Um, so Arthur Johns is so polite. So, so polite when it comes to responding, Mr. Wempress. Mr. Wempress's comments on the ratio of top speed of aircraft to landing speed and progressive increase in both great interesting connection with carriers, and possibly even more in other types of airship fitted with catapults, where presumably the launching speed will be consistently increasing. He asked what would be the effect on aircraft carriers if the present type of aircraft were replaced by also gyros. My knowledge of the latter is limited, but I have always understood that they are of little value for military purposes, and their peculiar construction increases their height beyond that of the ordinary type, thus requiring a greater height of hangar in the carrier than is usual. So Empress states that height is now no greater than the others. What floor space is required for storage, I, am not, I do not know, but supposing it is not very difficult, different from the type of present fleet aircraft, it would seem for the same number, and for transport at the speed fees that uh, it would, that of the fleet which carrier accompanies, the size of the carrier would be uh, but little difference from that from the ordinary types of aircraft. Possibly some fittings, arresting gear, for instance, would not be required, and length of flight deck might be reduced. These are, however, speculations which would have been confirmed by experience. I, he ignores the stupid man bringing up the idea about putting aircraft in a floating airship. After all, everyone knows how easily, uh, how much, how many airships were shut down, uh, shot down. <sighs> there is one in every generation that starts bringing up the idea of air, using airships for supporting aircraft. And honestly, they have a very good idea, but those things would be called space stations or spaceships, not airships. Dirt Squad, hmm, Home Office. You're not allowed those 916-inch guns. Me, okay. You're welcome to come and try to work out how to remove them. Home Office, hmm. Turns out you are allowed them after all. That would be interesting. Tian Wang, put Roger Keys in charge of pandemic control. That's not a good scenario for anyone. I love Roger, but I think him in charge of pandemic control would not be good. It would end up with a small dictatorship going on. Vision. Smaller airships would have worked, like US ASW blimps, carrying perhaps an airplane, depth charges, and both of us to attack subs. Hmm.
Yeah, we're not getting into the aircraft carrying Zeppelin. Although, I will be back in a second. It, it might have required a few bottles of this stuff to work out how much can be fair, how, how best, most efficiently to use my glass for brew ships. So, um, yeah. It's all in the name of science and good history. It's 38 and it's 39. I don't know. So, what questions are we done? Uh, right, let's see. Juno 1 Island, airships, meet AIM 54 Phoenix. Uh, Grisselton, 1940 airships could carry more payload than fixed wing. Hence the interest. I, I agree, but by 1934... This is the trouble with the air ministry. Some of them are drinking the Kool-Aid. And especially when he talks about maintenance of aircraft. So you see, I agree that they could carry the aircraft. But if you're talking about the maintenance facilities, all the things the Royal Navy builds into its aircraft carriers for long-range operations, rearming them, carrying the weapons to rearm them, carrying, uh, doing the maintenance, uh, keeping the aircraft going, all these things for weeks, months at a time. The airship is a great idea on paper. It's until you start trying to look at those papers and going through the practicalities. Then and that's when it breaks down. And that is the problem with a lot of the air power theory that gets pushed in the mid-1930s. It's all great up here in theory. It's terrible out there in practice. Andrew Cox, good evening. What have I missed? Have I missed it? No. Do you know what I'm on? In World of Warships, Vermont, 70,000 ton Silmans line, is able to reach 17, 27 knots with a 68,000 horsepower engine. Me and a friend did the maths and thought it's not possible. Uh... Uh, 
there are cruisers which have more horsepower, less weight than that, and still reach that high uh, and and reach lower speeds than that. So uh, yeah, do you know one oh one? I would say I, I I haven't done the maths myself, but I would say you would need a very 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 forgiving hull design to be able to get that. And as far as I know, the Tillman hulls were not that forgiving. They had many many good aspects, but forgiveness was not one of them. And I'm just seeing if the fluffy research assistant is free. Right then. So, 1936. And what paper do you want from 1936? What is the ideal paper to look at in 1936? Well, oh, the index had managed to get to the outside of the bed. Phew, good lord. If you're dropping depth charges from an airship, you have problems. You might as well just drop rods from a god at that point. They're not going to hit anywhere near the target in that period. Uh, we are, not a wolf. We are seeing a comeback when it comes to airships. Would they have applications of unmanned craft or drones? Maybe AW? What are your thoughts? I would certainly consider airships for AW. For non consumable tasks, they could well be a very good idea. So, 1936. And, oh. Well, there are lots of different ones we could go to, but I'm just going to go with um, Rear Admiral HG Fursfield's Modern Trend in Warship Design. Paper number one. I am not going to comment about you're just dreaming of a shield heli carrier, but um, that does seem to be what you're all driving towards. And we'd love it to work. But remember, the shield heli carriers pretty much end up as spaceships. And there is a reason for that. It is a great diffidence that I address the Institute of Naval Architectures. I have no claim to be an expert on of the art or practice of naval architecture, or the process by which practitioners of the art so miraculously satisfy the conflicting demands made upon them by the various branches of the service in which I have spent my active career. I do not therefore propose to touch upon the details of the design of ships, or the comparative merits of this or that feature in different classes of man of war. I do not propose to go into the details of hulls, gun mountings, arrangements of propelling machinery, or accept very superficially the arrangement of arm protection. It's my aim to put before you some broad considerations affecting the design of fighting ships, and to speculate on a line upon which they may be expected to develop in the future. This is 1938, remember? 1936, remember? And this is a paper which is that thick. And he himself isn't putting forward much, as he says. He talks about the different battleships. <sighs> Start off with. It is perhaps not easy to day and not easy today to pick out definitive tendencies in the development of warship design, but one at least seems to be clearly marked. That is the tendency towards reduction in the size of battleships. It is true that there are only two battleships in the service today which were completed since 1921, and those two are the largest afloat, the Nelson and Romney. But they were built in a hurry, while the Admiralties of the world were still in the grip of the theory that each new ship built must be more powerful and therefore bigger than the last. 
That theory had held sway with hardly any intermission since the 60s of the last century, when wooden ships first began to be replaced by those of iron and later steel. Up to the end of the 80s, there was a general agreement in all navies that the 10,000 tons was about the maximum displacement of a well-designed battleship. Thereafter, dimensions began to grow, following the lead given by the British Navy. By 1894, we were building a majestic class of battleships of 15,000 tons. Ten years later, we had passed to the King Edward VII class of 16,350 tons, to be followed by the Lord Nelsons of 16,500 tons. Then began a more rapid increase, heralded by the much-advertised new departure, really a reversion to early ideas. That all-big gun ship of which Dreadnought was the first, had a space with 17,900 tons, but the latter ships in the same type grew to the 22,500 tons of the Orion class, while their guns inc were increased from 12-inch calibre, which had been surrounded for so many years, to 13.5-inch. Just before the war, we increased again to the 25,750 tons of the Royal Sovereigns and the 27,500 tons of the Queen Elizabeth classes, and the guns grew once more to 15-inch. While during the war, the cattle ships laid down, of which only one, Hood, was completed, were of 42,000 tons. Ships of even greater displacement were projected after the war and would have been built but for the halt called by the Washington Treaty. The British Navy led the way in this battle of the building yards, but it was followed by all the others. The reason for the reaction against constant growth is not far, not far to seek. It is that ships of as much as 35,000 tons are approaching the point at which they cease, in a phrase coined, I believe, in America, to be harbour-worthy. From the point of view of moving and fighting at sea, there is no limit to the size of ships. But ships can no more remain permanently at sea than aeroplanes can stay permanently in the air. They spend the greater part of their lives in harbour, and if men of war are to fulfil the functions for which they were built, they must be capable of using not only the harbours specifically prepared for them, but also such harbours as are available in those parts of the world in which they will have to operate in war. The bigger ships, the fewer are the harbours they can use, and fewer still those in which they can be docked and repaired. The unsinkable ship is a vain dream. However big she may be, and no ship can operate away from a base for more than a limited period, there comes a point when increasing of size, though it may provide increased hurting power and a lesser measure of vulnerability, actually decreases the fighting value of a ship by debarring her from operating in many of the seas in which her services may be needed. The same tendency towards checking the process of growth is seen noted in the cruiser projected today. And this appears to be a very recent recurrence. The growth of cruisers before the war is well known to all. In the early years of the present century, the construction of small cruisers practically ceased in the British Navy, and the only cruisers built grew in size and armament from the near class of 11,000 tons of 6-inch guns to the Minotaur class of 14,600 tons armed with 9.2 and 7.5-inch guns. Finally, under the stimulus of Lord Fisher, they grew into the battle cruiser, which in its latest form, the Hood, became indistinguishable from the battleship. Yet in 1913, it seemed it should to be realised that the process had gone too far. Cruisers had become so costly that they could not be provided numbers sufficient for the reconnaissance needs of the battle fleet of the day, and so clumsy that they could not carry out ordinary reconnaissance efficiently. So a start had to be made once more with small cruisers. Hence the Aurora class of some 3,000 tons, which did such good service in the early days of the war. Hardly had they been produced... Hello, Flutter. I'll bring him down. I won't be not uh, bring him down when I'm finished. Hello, you. You come to keep me company. The fluffy research assistant has arrived. At the moment, he's inspecting the pile of books over there. You know, he's basically, you know, never worked with children or animals. Hardly had they produced, however, than the process of growth began once more, and they were followed by the sea class, averaging 4,000 tons with which, for the greater part of the war, the Navy was well satisfied. Excellent as were the sea class for the duties required on them in late war, they lacked the endurance necessary for ships to be employed in oceans wider than the North Sea, and they were followed by the Ds of 4,850 tons and the Es of 7,500 tons, and the Hawkins class of 9,800 tons. 
It was particularly unfortunate this last class was actually built, since their existence in 1921 was probably responsible for the limits of the cruisers adopted in the Washington Treaty being set as high as 10,000 tons and 8-inch guns. But for them, the Washington limits would probably have been fixed at the dimensions of the E-class, i.e. 7,500 tons with 6-inch guns. Navies of the world would have been saved many millions. How about you? Now, pretty much, this is an interesting paper because it goes through everything. But then it starts off with discussion. And the discussion mm, includes a particular admiral who you all know I love to take the piss out of because I consider him a peculiarly special kind of nincompoop. The Admiral, the Right Honourable, the Earl of Cork and Orrery. Orrery. How the he was invited in, I do not know. I propose only to offer a very few remarks of a general nature. I'm not going to follow Captain Ackworth in the, into the wider realm of naval construction. I have a sound faith in the people in charge who are producing these ships, and I'm going to confine myself more or less to the one type of ship, uh, one, uh, one type of the ships about to be produced. Aaron Fursfield, in his very interesting paper, pointed out that there was a definite tendency towards a reduction in the size of battleships. I cannot help thinking that the ever-increasing cost of these large vessels is just as strong a reason for this tendency as what he described as harbour worthiness. There is also the theory that it is a mistake to put all your eggs into one basket, and that must be taken into account. As Admiral Fursfield points out, however, the last word on the subject really rests with the United States and Japan. Japan is most likely to, unlikely to reduce the size of her ships unless she is sure the United States are going to do the same. There is a difference between the Pacific problem and the Atlantic problem, and those two nations are thinking in terms of the Pacific, whereas we and the European nations think in terms of the Atlantic. No, we in Europe, uh, if you'd actually bothered to read the Third Sea Lords papers at the time, you'd realize Britain's thinking in terms of the world. They can't just think in terms of the Atlantic because the empire doesn't just exist in the Atlantic. Basically, the Atlantic and Pacific concepts is kind of like the continental and blue water strategies which affect Britain at certain points. When people go, we've got to have a continental foreign policy or a blue water foreign policy. Having, oh, we are only an Atlantic Navy, but we're operating in the Indian Ocean and Pacific as well because we have a global empire and global commitments. Uh, 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 versus they're just Pacific navies, but the Americans are operating in the Atlantic as well. Uh, 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 it's confusing for them. Um, there is a difference between a Pacific problem and Atlantic problem, and those two nations are thinking in terms of Pacific, whereas we in the European nations think in terms of Atlantic. I do not think we have much a hope of reduction in size coming from the United States, who naturally do not want to reduce, wish to reduce the seaworthiness of their ships, which have the Pacific problems to think about. No doubt it would suit Japan's book if we all reduced the size of battleships and all other ships, because she would uh, then have her corner of the world more to herself than she has at present. Naval architecture always seems to be a very, have a very hard time. I'm referring to those who are more particularly concerned with designing of fighting ships. Naval officers clamor for more, uh, for more innovations, and naval architect has to produce a compromise. If that compromise is a success, naval staff pat themselves on the back. If it's a failure, what are constructors doing? Naval architects nowadays, I think, suffer from a disadvantage, and they cannot try out their novel ideas and use them improvements in a way that they used to when they had to design and construct ships for foreign countries. That, to me, is a great deprivation. It means we are not getting the ideas that we otherwise should have. I can remember, throughout my time, ships of this nature, which had originally been built for foreign powers, which had been, for one reason or other, incorporated into the fleet. The others, I recollect, were being the Scorpion and Wyvern, which were originally designed as ironclads for the Confederate States of America. Everybody will recall these wonderful small battleships, the Triumph and the Swiftsure, and later we had the Canada, the Argentine, and Eagle. I was always brought up the idea there was something wrong with ships built in private yards, that the scantling was not sufficient, or there was not always a sufficient margin of safety in foreign ships. But in nearly 50 years' service, I cannot remember hearing that one of those ships failed on that account. A very distinguished officer the other day said a carrier is only a bad aerodrome, but I think he forgot to uh, the fact that by means of the aircraft of the carrier, you can transport your planes a thousand miles nearer your objective in 48 hours, which all the aerodromes in England cannot do. And that under some conditions, no, no, mobility makes up for lack of space and other conveniences. A prominent politician returned, uh, referred to aircraft carriers as floating aerodromes. What he should have done as said, was mobile aerodromes. If you have mobility, you can sacrifice a lot.
That is the one point he and I actually agree on. But that was 1936. Let's see the questions. Hmm, let's see. Parasite will struggle to carry depth charge. Yes, and I'm from, hmm, airships for AW range might help um, fix in uh, 1982. Re Andrew Cox, reduction in size of battleships. Not sure you got one all right. Not a lot in that debate is right. Here from 1938, Essex. Ooh, care of reporting. Uh, Dan Freeman, boo to the boring deck crowds to the session with being able to fit in a dock or being able to sail into a harbour. Rubbish. Hundred a million ton super mega uh, super duper mega dreadnought. Yowza. That'd be scary. If I saw a million tons of super duper dreadnought heading towards me, I think I'd go nuke them straight away. Yeah, yes, but aircraft carriers have a one horse race since the nineteen fifties. Mm, yes and no. The thing is, the aircraft carrier isn't really the threat. It's the air group it can carry. And I would argue that the aircraft, while the aircraft carrier might seem to be slow in evolution and be stuck there, it's because it's the air group which matters far more than the ship. The ship is designed, and the ship and air group have to work together in syncopation. So you need to work on the electronics of the ship. You need to work on the ability of the ship to operate those aircraft. But mm hmm. You know, is he championing Argentina as a concept? Probably. All right. So, the last one, 1939. And then, at certain points, we have to get downstairs for something this evening. So, uh, theoretically, I'm supposed to finish by 9.15 this evening. This is 1939. Institutional Architects, and um, this book, of course, has the obituary for Admiral Henderson in, so some people need to take a drink if they're playing the bingo game now, and that's a lovely picture of the Honorary President in, but it also has, as its first section, produced an, a paper presented by Stanley Goodall on HMS Ark Royal. And for this one, they made a special consideration. Yep, those are designs of HMS Ark Royal. I'll post them again if you want. Are you sitting on my phone? Sorry, I had to play swapsies for the phone. Yes, I love you too. Brewships, 
13. Right then. So. Protection. Aircraft being the most likely attackers, the vitals are protected by a heavy deck. The vertical protection is of a sufficient scale to prevent destruction by lucky hits from enemy warships fast and fortunate enough to get within range. Underwater protection of an improved bulge type has been provided over a considerable portion of the length. Beyond this, closer water type to subdivision is arranged. In other words, she should have survived being hit by a torpedo. There's also some lovely pictures in here of her, um, which he used to illustrate his his destruct his things. Various plates, and you get into the discussion. Now, this the as you have all heard from me in the past, one of my favorite things about Stanley Goodall, although there are parts of times I like him, parts of times I find him a bit strange. One of my favourite things about him is his put-downs of people when they ask stupid questions. This comes to a fine art during World War II, um, especially of people he thinks who actually have potential to learn. He is puts them down in a way that they are encouraged to go learn. People who he thinks should know better, he puts them down in a way that basically tells them to go and learn. And people who he thinks are beyond redemption and he doesn't care about, he just crushes. Um, for example, Admiral Kennedy Perth spoke of the fact that lifts can take aircraft only when their wings are folded. He added rightly that the disability of a lift large enough to take aircraft not folded is the great gash it involves in the strength deck of the flight ship. This disability increases as the spread of the wings of the aircraft increases, and that is the trend of aircraft development. But that is a further disability, namely that a bigger lift means a larger space taken out of the hangar, and the larger that is, of course, the less the number of aircraft that can be accommodated in the ship. Hence, deck edge lifts come about. Admiral Sir George Pierce and Captain Ford added greatly to the value of the paper by the remarks on the machinery. The only comment I would have to make is to express the pleasure I derive from working with them, particularly since Admiral Priest and I were students together many years ago. Sudo Eustace Dinnercourt made some kind remarks, and I think it should be a source of satisfaction to him to see that the aircraft carrier of today is so largely modelled on the successful converse, uh, conversions for which he was responsible when he was Director of Naval Construction. He asked in particular about the propulsion efficiency of the triple screw arrangement. I must confess that when this was adopted, a number of us were extremely pessimistic. This pe that pessimism was shown to be somewhat conservative estimate of the power necessary for the desired speed. The propulsion efficiency is exceedingly high, Quite as high as that of the forge a shaft ship. Mr. John spoke of welding problems. As Mr. Nichols' paper, to be read shortly, deals with several of his points of discussion, that will then follow should provide a better opportunity than the present for remarks on welding. I hope that what he has said now will be taken up in the discussion the day after tomorrow. My lord, the institution has been congratulated on having here today the captain of the ship. I'm sure we all enjoy very much the breath of fresh air that Captain Power brought to us from the sea. In particular, I was pleased to hear him state that we have, n he, we have not overall overcalled our hand. But I was sorry to hear his remarks about the double platform lifts because we are rather proud of them. The problem set to the department was to get the aircraft up from two hangars in as quick as time as possible. In fact, to try and forget that there were actually two hangars below and deliver the aircraft to the flight deck as rapidly as if there was only one hangar. So Alpha John set this problem to the constructor in charge and he worried and worried until last he came in one morning trying to announce that he had found a solution. After listening to an explanation of the scheme, Sir Arthur explained, exclaimed, fine, that's good, go ahead. I got hold of the constructor afterwards and asked him what had happened. He said, I spent all yesterday evening meditating on the problem, and at last the idea came into my mind. I said, "What did you? where did you spend the evening? He replied, at the Savoy Cabaret. I would advise any donors who are not habit habitiers to pay a visit to the Savoy and inspect mechanisms under the dance floor. 
With regard to Captain Power's remarks on the position of the arrestor wires, of course, they could be placed further forward, but I hope I shall be drawing a correct deduction from his criticism if I propose in a new design that the number of arrestor wires be reduced. When sp uh, speaking of the island structure, Captain Power emphasised adequate in such a manner that I spent alterations and additions. <laughs> Admiral Davis spoke of accommodation difficulties. The heating up of the ship in hot climates is certainly a problem. The flight deck of a carrier should not be covered with wood, so that it is just a big steel area. It should not be covered with wood, so that it is just a big steel area covered with suitable composition, and receiving the rays of sun and radiating the heat below. The nuisance can only be partly mitigated by good ventilation, for you cannot blow away radiant heat. He is good. We do not need a Discord discussion on where we all fail or fall on the good old scale. Eh, it was always fun. Anyway, that's it. That's 1939, and that was a very good one. How did he classify Mountbatten? You don't want to go there. Okay. How about you come into my lap for the last few minutes? And, and I will keep you company. Oh. Right then. So. Oh. I'll let you. Mm. Hello. For the savage put down, we have to go to World War Two. Some of the ones in World War Two are absolutely biting. What Stanley Goodall does, <laughs> right? Then. Yeah, just alter that a bit to make it more visible for me. Oh. So, questions. Do you have any? As I said, well, I'll do in about another 10 minutes this evening because we've got to go downstairs and deal, sort of do a family thing. Do you want to show you? I think, uh, oh, Vision, I think that dog violates treaty tonnage limits. He's only a poodle. He ain't heavy. He's my puppy. Although he is currently licking my hand. Um, Tian Wang, how about using 15 inch guns for three by three, both for King George V and Lions as a stop back? That would have worked quite happily. You're going to make the trainee jealous. The trainee doesn't get to spend as much time up here because the trainee is still going through um, potty training. This one is has always been very good. Mainly because I think he has ambitions of sleeping on a human bed, because that's about big enough for him. Dan Freeman, I have visions of someone attempting to weaponize and standardize HMS Eskimo's bow as a standard size for projectiles. That would have certainly been interesting. That would have been very interesting to have achieved. If someone could have achieved that, it would have been um, painful. But really, you have to think of it more as the bow. And there is a point you do have to remember the number of people who did die when the bow was lost. But the fact is also the bow provided the protection that took the that took the hit for the ship. And well, when it was lost in Narvik, it lost a few people. But you know, basically, the bow protect took the hit for the ship, and the ship could survive without the bow. So the thing was. In a way, I suppose the bow was kind of like it's, um... Ooh, I'm trying to think. Well... It's the capping armour. In a way, it was this decapping bow. It took the torpedo hit. Tin, what happened to American 16-inch Mark II guns? Don't go there. 
a whole load of debates and a whole load of people having arguments. If I put that like that, that should be okay, should pick me up all right, and I can stretch out and let him stretch out as well. How about you? Uh, Rapid Racer, many, but the really good ones have to wait until the carriers in the 20s and 30s debate. That is the thing. There are There is a reason I've been using the transaction papers I've been using today, because those documents have provided a lot of the stuff for the carriers of the 20s and 30s discussions. Here again, how does uh, how were design conflicts at the RN finally resolved, and what is the process? Simple answer. I understand this question could be really complex. <sighs> These days, it's uh, long debate of committees, and a lot of discussion with between contractors, Ministry of Defence, and all those things. In the 1920s and 1930s period in World War II, there was the Director of Naval Construction and the Third Sea Lord. And after there was permission to build a ship granted and the plans were approved, any other questions until that ship ended service largely, unless they m constituted a major change to the capabilities of that vessel, uh, and a major change to its role and more than anything, uh, would just be dealt with by the third seal or the director of construction. In that, if it was an architectural problem, the NC would make a recommendation. If it was a operational problem in terms of how it being perceived, it would be the third seal lord would go, yep, nope, or what the are you on? Okay, Adrian, what did uh, uh, yeah, what did Goodall say about uh, Mount Baden? Mount Baden kept good, uh, very clear of Goodall. Most of the time, very sensibly. Andrew Cox, I didn't realize Ark had ventilation problems in the Far East. Although it seems a lot of ships, uh, RN ships did. RN didn't make it to the Far East. Uh, Ark didn't make it to the Far East. She was lost in the Mediterranean, unfortunately. Uh, but she was okay. She uh, she had it wasn't so much ventilation problems as people were always complaining about the idea of a. Basically, uh, there were some people who found any way to complain about an aircraft carrier possible, and their idea was a big steel box, aka a hangar, must be an oven. Then us, I re his bow. The bow lost a few lives. It proved the value of internal subdivision. It does, and the strength of that internal subdivision. Uh, so, so the office will have a surplus navy rack for assistance. I'm training. We have um, basically they are going to have a lot of space in the in, in the office. Let's put it this way: there is going to be a special space for them. Liam Carpenter, Daisy the Flag class Jack Russell spotted the fluffy research assistant on TV. Fire stick is a wonderful thing. She raised her head and barked. Cool. Hello, Daisy. Mission. It's remarkable looking at several generations of aircraft types in rapid succession. You see carrier aviation in the 1920s to 1970s, from biplanes to jets on a few carrier hulls. Which is why I always tell people to be careful about saying any developments in aircraft are going to lead to the aircraft carrier's demise. Because ultimately, the aircraft carrier is that is a mobile aerodrome, a mobile airbase. And with a whole lot of other facilities, including it. And as long as aircraft need maintenance and they need to be rearmed on the ground, and they need to be looked at, and the pilot, uh, uh, you know, they are going to need them. Because uh, if you consider Britain, hello, they were looking at the design of aircraft carriers and thinking about land-based air, 
And the odds were, once they started considering a global presence or having a presence outside certain areas, it suddenly gets very expensive to have air bases all over the world which can provide for the quality of aircraft which you now wish to deploy. Because as aircraft have got more expensive and more complex, maintenance, maintenance of them, whilst it's simpler in some ways, has also got more demanding in others. So, Thompson, no, you haven't made another HMS captain. Uh, new AKB 472. So I take it the fluffy researcher system does not curl up next to you at night. Um, not that mummy knows about, does it? Do you? No. Not that mummy knows about. Never would do it, would he? Never. You have to stay downstairs in your bed, don't you? Tian Wang, uh, or Golden Eagle, good, good old on key Somerville and Pound. Pound he found annoying, Somerville he thought was okay, he worked with him on some of the radio, radar projects, and Keys and Sir Goodall had done a lot of work together on designing ships at various points, so they're quite good. Basically, Goodall was always very happy that Keys and he had worked together all the basic concepts for the amphibious ships and combined operation shipping before Mountbatten took charge. So, you know... Managed to get the important work out of the way for Patty. Uh, uh, Andrew Cox, but the article was going on to about too much heat in the hangar. Was that just speculation? It was mostly speculation. It was basically people going, oh, this is going to get very hot. And Goodall going, well, we haven't taken it anywhere where it can get very hot yet. When we do, we'll find out whether the uh, whether it works or whether the ventilation we put in works or not. Hopefully, it should do. And to be honest, they found on some days if they didn't need to, they did keep the uh, they they kept the um, lifts down and various other things to help aerate it. But it was okay. It wasn't it wasn't particularly nice in there, but it wasn't also particularly dangerous to crew. It was just hot, so the crew were mostly working in their shorts, which annoys some officers, but most of them just get on with it. DM Carbonum, the summer we had a, had the teacup on BB-55, the second uh, second deck was nearly untenable. The amount of insulation the teak provided was amazing. The British didn't want wood on their decks, though, because they decided it was a fire risk. Vision. The logic of carriers is simple. If you're China and you need air power of Africa... You need a mobile airfield. You need an aircraft carrier. Same for other world powers. It is. It's very simple. It's why when people go, oh, this is it's over, it's sitting there going, is it really? It's cold realism. Yes, it's going to cost a lot to defend it, but it'll cost you even more to try and do operations about it. Global strike weapons, i.e. ballistic gliders, are also wonderful, but a tad expensive when you have to bomb around 100 T-54s and like 3,000 strong militias and pickups or mules. True. And they also... That's not the only issue with them. Because, again, if you start launching ballistic missiles, other powers can get very antsy at you. And it's not tactical on-call air power if you've got troops in harm's way.
Yogi Khan, not being British, why does everyone hate Mount Bandit so much? We don't so much hate him as... Uh, he is... There are examples in the British system where patronage works very well. And there are parts in the British system, where examples in the British system, where you have people promoted rapidly, because, largely because they already have been promoted and because no one else has any idea of where to put them or what to do with them. Mountbatten is a classic example of that. Take care, John Shea. Next live will be Thursday. There'll be a long patrol out Tuesday, but the next live will be Thursday. Do you know what I am? They, people say aircraft carriers are obsolete. They are the same people that are scared of them and want the nightmare to end. Yep, time is coming up, roughly. It's... Uh, uh, sh I'm technically five minutes over, but um, yeah. No one's called me quite yet. Uh, Mark Rapid Ray is back. I'm going to want supplemental reading for carriers of the 20s and 30s. Basically, John Jordan warships after Washington and warships after London. Should be fairly good reading for that. Um, most of the rest is coming from the Institution Naval Architecture papers and some stuff on the Japanese Navy and US Navy aircraft carriers. And thanks to Freeman. Take care, everyone. Do you want to say goodbye? Do you want to say goodbye? Yeah. Ooh, hello. Bye bye. Bye bye. Come on. You you heard movements downstairs. You know there's discussing food. Okay. Yes, we'll be heading off downstairs now. Take care, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Calvin Gasper. Thank you, DM Carpenter. Thank you, Bijan. Thank you, Yikas, Yogi Khan, Dan Freeman, Abuzaski, Adept Squad. Take care. Have a nice evening. Chris Southgate. Thank you, Juno 1011. Thank you, Sean Mack and Dan Freeman. And extra special thanks for being the administrators this evening and helping with the, keeping the chat going well. Nautic Wolf. Thank you. Constant Drowsiness. Thank you. And Andrew Reynolds. Thank you. Grace Sarsky. Thank you. Rick Valsava. Thank you. I think I got that right this time. Eric Akern. Thank you. And Ting Wang, aka Golden Eagle. Take care. Take care and rapid raise back and vision and depth squad. Have fun. And Stafford Thompson, take well. And again, if anyone's interested in submitting to bilge pumps for a to take part in an episode, please send that email to that email below, bilgepumpsofsimsec at gmail.com. Take care, everyone. And see you Thursday. Take care. And thank you for joining me for the last brew ships of 2020. Next one will officially be the first brew ships of 2021. Take care, everyone. Thank you.